Everybody's running. <laughs> everyone just make sure that your mobile phones are switched off. Socially distanced from this lady here. Or someone should have told you. Who was in the room? You're not, you're like, you haven't got a mask on and you're sitting less than two metres away. Who was in your court yesterday? Oh, exactly. No, I mean, who was the usher? Yeah. Uh, I'll find out then. Well, it says.
Electronically, yeah. Appeal in the matter of Sotheby's and Mark Wise Limited and others, part her. Yes. My Lord, my Lady, we noted a, a total of six requests from information during the submissions yesterday. Prepared a short response, which we did try to send. Yes, it has reached us. Thank you very much. Uh, there's been one development since then. You would have seen that the first response was a uh, trial timetable was to be prepared and agreed. That's now been done. Excellent. Um, I do have paper copies, or we can distribute that electronically later as well. If paper copy? I have, I have three here. Um, shall I? Well, we're rather supposed not yes. to hand things off. Yeah, yeah, so maybe if we do it by email. So I think we'll get it done by email. If you don't mind doing it by email. That, 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 that's, um, that's fine. Yeah. Um, my Lord, my, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Mm. My Lord, my Lady, um, I propose to deal with matters in the order the judge dealt with them, uh, to start with privacy. Yeah. Um, and, and then to deal with them uh, as, as he did. So, to begin with privacy and sub agency, if I can call it that, you'll have got our primary submission, of course, but this is not a sub agency case. At least it's not relevant. A sub agency. Yes. Uh, the sub agency authorities that the appellant relies on are not, as the judge rightly put it, engaged on the factual pattern of this case at all. And in fact, they're a red herring when you analyse what really happened in this case. And the primary reason they're a red herring is that this is not a case of simple delegation of authority by an agent to a sub agent at all, oh, primarily. Oh, Sorry. It's not, right. not a case of simple de delegation by of, agent of authority by an agent to sub agent at all. The contractual arrangements for the consignment of an old master for sale by Sotheby's obviously went well beyond what uh, uh, would be called a delegation of authority. That's to say, well beyond Sotheby's simply <coughs> being given the authority to bind the owners of the painting to a contract of sale with the buyer. <coughs> which is the limit, that, that, that delegation of authority to bind buyer to seller is the limit of what could properly be called in this case a delegation of authority from agent to sub agent. <coughs> Instead, of course, this particular and peculiar relationship in the terms primarily of contract A coupled with contract B includes both an agency relationship allowing sellers to pass title and uh, the buyer to, to be obliged to the seller to give the money back uh, in the other direction. But it's also, and primarily, a consignment agreement with an auction house. I say auction house, but shorthand, of course, in this instance, it wasn't acting as an auctioneer, but it was acting as the institution for a fine art private sale. Yes. But Sotheby's <coughs> and a handful of other entities are uniquely placed to perform. And they're employed, or they're, they're engaged in that consignment activity, not <coughs> to pass title simpliciter, but because they are Sotheby's, or whoever else they may be, yeah. because they offer consignment services and they add value to the transaction yeah. between buyer and seller. I mean, that point might by itself not be enough for you if there were no evidence that Mr. Kovitz had approved 
the entry into contract A. I mean, that's where the cross-examination comes in. Quite. He gave carte blanche. Quite. And, but what, it, what that point shows is that the question Mr. Collins wants you to answer, yeah. which is, are we within an exception to the sub-agency cases, is simply the wrong question. Yeah. And the judge realised that and, 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 and asked the relevant question, which is, as your lordship says, did uh, MWL give Fairlight implicitly or expressly I'm sorry, I've got that the wrong way around, of course. <laughs> and I tried to say yeah. it out. Did Fairlight implicitly or expressly authorise MWL to come to terms with Sotheby's for a consignment of the painting on terms that bound the owners together as principles to Sotheby's? Now, put like that, the answer is, in my respectful submission, obvious. Of course they did. No owner of property expressly being asked whether they are prepared to commit, which is the language that used, is used in that email, to a consignment to an auction house for the sale of their property, could remotely conceive that that would not engage them in terms with the auction house. Standing back and looking at it entirely objectively, anybody who's consigning their property to Sotheby's for a sale will, have, will know inevitably there will have to be terms between them and Sotheby's as to risk, as to delivery, as to all manner of things like payment of terms, timings, um, inspections. And above all, of course, in the case of, a grant, grant, uh, of an old master like this, authenticity. Because it's notorious, it's obvious, that when you go to Sotheby's and someone pays them a lot of money for their services, the parties are contracting to add value to the transaction, because Sotheby's puts its name and its reputation, and ultimately its balance sheet, behind its description of the painting, in the form of the authenticity guarantee that, that we, we are very familiar with. And any buyer, <coughs> any seller, just as any buyer, uh, would have to know, and did know, and must know, and objectively it's clear, that those terms would have to bind both owners <coughs> to make any sense. Now, so that's, that's the short answer to why Mr. Collins asked the wrong question. And if you like, um, what he didn't do, and it was notable that he'd spent very little time looking at contract A at all. And that's because contract A is the problem for him. Because it's a consignment agreement, as they call it themselves in their uh, appeal skeleton, and not just an agency delegation document. It's full of the terms that you'd expect, principles, owners, sellers of property to contract directly with Sotheby's for and manage their relationship. It included, and I don't make any bones about this, a, a delegation of authority mm. on behalf of <coughs> these sellers but to, to Sotheby's. But it certainly wasn't merely that kind of document. Now, amongst those packages of rights and obligations that we say clearly and the judge found existed as between seller and Sotheby's are, of course, those and I'm going, to, I'm going to call them the authenticity guarantee and the seller's obligation to rescind, which are the labels we've used in our documents. But what I mean by that, of course, is the package of rights and obligations within those clauses, both given by and to sellers on one hand and, and Sotheby's on the other uh, in contract A, and their equivalent given between Sotheby's on one hand and the buyer on the other in contract B. Now, just ask yourself this question, which is at the nub of the case, really. When agreeing those terms for the authenticity guarantee and, uh, and rescission uh, obligation... In contract A. In contract A. Can it possibly be said that Mark Vice Limited was delegating something it had been given authority to do from Fairlight? Mark Weiss had no authority from Fairlight to give or accept authenticity guarantees and obligations to rescind in specific conditions. It, it, in agreeing the <coughs> authenticity guarantee and package of obligations and rights that it came with, Mark Weiss was not delegating anything. It never had anything to delegate in that regard because those were obligations that were going to be owed and rights uh, to be owed as between seller and Sotheby's in, in contract A. 
So you don't get to the point, which is the starting point for the sub-agency cases, is, is there a relevant delegation of authority? Because the, the obligations and rights we're concerned with have nothing to do with delegated authority. Putting it another way, at the risk of trying your lordships and your ladyships patience, perhaps, I ask you to consider this, that Mott Vice Limited was clearly wearing two hats when it signed Contract A. He, and, and this is true even on my learned friend's case. He, he has to accept it. MWL was both the co-beneficial owner and therefore the joint seller of the property, the painting, consigning it to Sotheby's, undoubtedly and admittedly qua principle, these are these Sotheby's. That's the hat that's relevant here. And it was also wearing a second hat, which was to bind Fairlight, the co-owner, and actual, uh, other actual seller of the property, both to that relationship with Sotheby's for, um, as seller, but also to give authority to, set, to, to Sotheby's on their joint behalves, the past title and so forth to the buyer. And that's really the key point, that on any analysis, and I think this is fair to say, even on my learned friend's case, he would have to accept, that MWL's engagement of Sotheby's was on any view done on its own behalf, as principal, contracting directly with Sotheby's. And that's, that, that means that in doing that, it can't have been acting as a delegator of authority. It was acting on, on its own behalf. So the question then resolves itself into the very simple one, in my submission, nothing to do with sub-agency cases. And that is the, the, the key question. When Mott Vice, as mm -hmm. co-owner and seller of the property, agreed those terms with Sotheby's, did it have the express or implied authority of Fairlight to do so on its behalf too? Uh, that question, the judge posed virtually in terms, but certainly answered in clear terms, in the affirmative based on his assessment of the evidence, including cross-examination, uh, and you'll see from the trial timetable who was cross-examined mm -hmm. and so forth. And, and, and you've seen his view of Mr. Kovitz's guarded answers to some of the more difficult questions. We'll, we'll come back to one of those in a moment. And in fact, Mr. Kovitz's relevant answers were absolutely explicit, as far as I could make out, okay. in, in terms of giving unfettered authority ah. to MWL. Well, you've read the bit I was going to show you, Lordships and Ladyship, which is, of course, the fact that he says, I gave him... I delegated, transferred to him authority to act in whatever way he judged fit. Yeah, were his exact words. I mean, he helpfully explained what he meant by the word delegate. Yes. Exactly. Probably had used as a kind of lawyer's word, and then was yes. very sensibly asked what he meant. By it. You'll see that Mr. Foxton picked him up on his repeated use of delegation because, of course, it it was a key part of the case yeah. that what was going on was delegation and authority to consign. But his explanation of what he meant was not the one that his lawyers would have been hoping for. I suspect that's right. But with respect to Mr. Collins, we don't need to go into that, really, because that's, that's, that's asking this court to, to appreciate the evidence. Well, but, not, I mean, we do, don't we? Because we have to be, I mean, insofar as it was a finding of fact, you know, we have to be clear that it was a finding that it was open to the judge to make. Yes, that's right. And um, for that purpose, I mean, the cross-examination seems to me, from your point of view, gold dust. Well, I'm very happy, of course, and absolutely, <laughs> you're absolutely right. By all means, do. I'm saying I don't need to go that Yeah, far. all right. But clearly, you, you, you've got the point, and, and I won't leave it. it. It's absolutely the end of the argument. The judge was not entitled to contradict the evidence. And it also That's shows that this was a new arrangement reached when the consignment questions came over the horizon, and therefore went far beyond what had been authorised <coughs> back in May with the, 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 the original delegation. Yes. Oh, we, we just discussed that with Mr. Collins yeah. yesterday, but is that a fair analysis to say that this idea that there was an overarching main head agency which everything followed is what the judge was considering to be, um, uh, well, the facts didn't support that overarching analysis. Yes, I think that's fair to say, my lady. I, what, what in my submission happened was that effectively at the beginning of the relationship, Mark Weiss was given authority to go out and see if he could conclude a sale himself yeah. at a certain price. What then happened, and it was always envisaged, of course, we can see from the documents, that they may involve a consignment to a third party auction, again, auction house or yes. a private sale uh, institution. And at that point, when it came clear that was the, the road they were going to go down. At a different price. 
at a different price. Start to, again. Start again. And in fact, we are very close in my submission, if not if squarely within the sort of exception one sees in the sub-agency cases, where there is really quite a complete delegation of the role Mark Weiss was originally intended to pay, play, which was finding a buyer, with a and re substitution by Sotheby's of his role. Because you'll recall that the agreement with Sotheby's is, is exclusive for three months. Yes. During that period, Mark Weiss was not allowed to act as agent uh, uh, to sell the property. But if it's a fresh agreement, if that's, the, that's a natural way. I mean, goodness knows what they were thinking at the time. Nobody would have been thinking about, well, that's the head agency, and now I'm in the sub-agency, and yes. goodness knows what. But if that is correct, and it's basically a fresh start, then you're not in sub-agency territory as a matter of analysis. No. Ignoring your even, even relevant delegation. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I think it is, yes, in my submission, it is my um, uh, and one set resets the clock and one looks at the relationship for what it is, which is, does one co consign property to uh, an auction house for sale on terms different from its of the other, the owner of the other half? I mean, it's a pretty absurd proposition in many respects. You know I mean? One thing I, I haven't bottomed out on the documents, perhaps you can help us with, is quite how and when the proposal for a um, a private sale by consignment first, as it were, entered the arena. I mean, we know from the cross-examination that there was, after it had done so, there was discussion between Mr. Kovitz, as, as you'd expect, between Mr. Kovitz and um, Mr. Wise. Um, but is there some document which um, actually helps us on that, or was it just accepted as part of the chronology? We can, as it were, just take on, take on trust. Well, uh, beyond the events of that my, my little friend has, has taken me to and described and yes. shown you, which is effectively, effectively the agreement that it happened at some point after the email. Yes. Um, I, I've, got, I've got in my notes a plan to take you to such evidence as I can see. That's, if you're coming I'll to that, that's absolutely I'll take fine. you to that. If I've omitted anything, I'll be no, told that's behind. I just really want to be sure there's not the a document there. lurking in the bundles, which I, I haven't yet. The answer down. is I don't believe that there's anything uh, material that you were not shown. There anything. is evidence. There was evidence before the judge that there were um, conversations between Mr. Kovitz and Mr. Weiss before Contract A was entered into about yeah. Contract A. And we get that from the exactly. indirect references from the emails to Mr. McDonald. That's right. Yeah. I've got to consult <coughs> with my partner first. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, you get the fact that the, well, I'll come to this, the, the unsigned version of Contract A is emailed to Mr. Kovitz. Yes. yes. We can't tell from the chronology whether that's before Mr. Weiss signed it or afterwards. It's the same day. Could be before or after, I don't know. Yeah. But the point is that Mr. Kovitz sees the terms on the day, at least, that they are signed. He says then he didn't see them for three days afterwards, missed them, overlooked them in his email box or something. Uh, but then probably uh, saw them. The judge found that, I think, that he did, uh, probably. And no, no complaint was made about them. And the, everything just proceeded until this issue arose. If, it, if it's not a sub-agency situation and it's a standard agency situation, then Fairlight was a, a disclosed but unnamed principal. That's it. Yeah, Molly, I was going to say exactly that. Right. It, 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 we're not quite in the undisclosed principal no. territory because somebody knew there was someone lurking. It but wouldn't matter, even if, but even the, if even it, it was not. No, and as your lordship said to Mr. Collins yesterday, that's right. And importantly, that's to be borne in mind when you're thinking about the Prentice dicta from Mr. Justice Ricks that you have to look at the intention of all three parties to answer this question. In my submission, that shows you that we're not even in the sub-agency cases at all, because you don't have to look at all three parties' intentions in an undisclosed principles case. The actual agent, uh, agent's intention at the end of the chain is not, in fact, relevant. Ex hypothesis, they will not be intending, because they don't know, that there is a, an undisclosed principle. So in a true undisclosed principle, uh, uh, and I would submit similarly in a, an unnamed principal case. And in fact, in any agency case that is not within Mr. Collins' authority, you're actually only looking at the intention of the agent, of the signatory to the, pro to the contract, and whether he was authorised expressly or implicitly by his principal to do so on, on their joint behalf or, or <coughs> only on the principal's behalf. One has to be a little bit careful about those authorities because they... I would reserve my position on whether Mr. Mm. Mrs. Ricks, with, with all due respect, was right about all three parties needing to contend the consequence. But it is academic in this case, because in my submission, the one thing that we do know 
is that Sotheby's were aware there was a partner in the painting's ownership. And <laughs> it is inconceivable that Sotheby's didn't believe uh, uh, that both owners were being bound to their consignment terms when Mr. Weiss signed, signed on behalf. Can I pause there then? You obviously got my primary submission on, on what we're, the true analysis of what we're looking at. And, and I would adopt in the alternative the idea that there was some fresh agreement, in fact, replacing the old broader agency arrangement when, when it was decided and agreed between the parties that they would consign to some of this on the exclusive terms that they did. But can I just pause there to note something rather, really rather important in all of this analysis, which I've sort of taken for granted but um, may, have, may not be totally clear. The judge held that the authenticity guarantee uh, and, and, and so forth, uh, as I've defined it, was, give, was given by Sotheby's as principle. Yeah. Uh, he says Sotheby's agreed that uh, authenticity provision. I'll just say with its con contractual counterparties for the moment, to keep it neutral. So which contract are you in now? I'm in both. Right. And, and, and as I can want to explain, my lady, I, really, we have to look at it as both because these contracts are not designed to be separated and treated as if they're not functionally uh, both achieving the objective of a sale and consignment. Doesn't that together. stymie your respondent's notice? Yes, right. absolutely fine. So you're abandoning respondent's notice? No, 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 my lord, no, no. It's I'll stymie. Oh, I'm so sorry, I think you said it's fine with your No, response. stymie, it's, it's stymie is your No, it doesn't, notice. my lady, as right, I'll explain okay. in a moment, but um, right. it, it probably doesn't matter. If you, if you um, but <laughs> the point is that when the judge found as he was right to do, that Sotheby's was giving that authenticity guarantee as principle because the parties wanted Sotheby's to put its balance sheet behind the guarantee of authenticity. Um, the judge effectively made the finding necessary for my, my entire case to succeed because it, the premise of what I said to you at the very beginning is that the terms of the consignment were agreed with Sotheby's as a principle and not merely as an agent for somebody else. And that finding by the judge, it's paragraphs 23 and 91 of the judgment. My learned friend took you, I think, to paragraph 23, if we could perhaps turn that up first. Sorry, let, I just need to make sure I understand that. So um, Sotheby's wasn't a sub-agent, it was a principal. Yes. It was not, not even an agent uh, uh, of any description. It was a principal contracting to put its balance sheet on the line, both towards the sellers and the buyers. <laughs> in contract A and contract B, respectively, if I can say that in a minute. Uh, and, and you'll see that in paragraph 23 of the judgment, page 76 of the bundle at tab 5, core, which is explicit. It was by contract A, the owners of paintings found themselves, and then it says that they incorporated in contract A uh, Sotheby's agreement to give the authenticity guarantee, brackets, in its own right, committing its own balance sheet to the buyer of the painting, and so Sotheby's obtained the right to require the seller to return the purchase price and accept the delivery. Now, my learned friend, um, for entirely obvious reasons, said, oh, we don't need to dwell on those words in brackets. Uh, and he didn't. But the, the important point for present purposes is there, there's no challenge to that finding anywhere in the appeal. And if you then turn to 91, where it's picked up because it, it comes back in in relation to another of the arguments which arose at the trial, but not on appeal. Which is a point rightly now not pursued at page 86. The judge says that he adds, there's no room for a fiduciary duty on the part of Sotheby's towards MWL and Fairlight, whereas here, Sotheby's itself provides the authenticity <coughs> guarantee with financial and reputational consequences attached. And whereas here, the role of making a determination was as much for the benefit of the buyer as the seller and I don't need to read the rest. But those findings which are not challenged are, are very important because the only basis on which Fairlight could claim that it was not bound by them is therefore to say they're not privy to the contracts containing them at all. And I'll show you why that's a peculiar position because contracts A and contract B say more or less the same thing as far as the owner's obligations. 
But you'll, you'll, you'll understand, I think, my lord and my lady, why the judge came to that conclusion, why it's obvious. Uh, in a contract of sale like this, as, as you observed yesterday, uh, my lord, uh, as lord Justice Henderson observed, um, people, want, people often want to keep their names off the papers and out of the limelight, and that is the way in which the original purchase of the painting by the uh, appellants was first done, as you, as you remarked. Uh, and the, the evidence at trial, which I don't think was challenged, was that the reason one has this contract A and contract B structure was precisely to delineate on one side the seller and on the other side the buyer, so that never the twain should meet. And the evidence was also that, as far as the buy, uh, sellers were concerned, they had no idea at the time who the buyer was. The buyer shouldn't and didn't formally know who the sellers were, although there is some evidence that Mr. Hedrine had figured out that Mr. Weiss was involved in because, of course, Mr. Weiss had commissioned a catalogue and it was known that he had some kind of interest of whatever nature in the painting. But the point is that once you, once you realise why the two contracts are separate, you also realise why it would be absurd or useless if the guarantee was not given by Sotheby's as principal. Because what buyer would be, would be interested in a guarantee from an unidentified, unknown seller of entirely unknown or absent creditworthiness. And equally, and I think this was also um, a point made at trial, often in these cases of art sales, you'll find that the seller is a trust or a, an estate of a deceased person in the nature of a liquidation of, a, 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 of an estate. And of course, within, within weeks, months, or moments even of a sale, the seller could disappear as a legal entity entirely. So no buyer would want a guarantee from a seller, and therefore it makes no sense to suggest that these authenticity guarantees were given by Sotheby's only as agent for the seller. And the judge found that, and there is no challenge to that. And that's obviously right. But once you, once you, once you um, accept that, as the, the appellants must, um, you are left in a peculiar position, because in both contracts there is a, an authenticity guarantee. And I'll cut. perhaps I'll come on to this now. Uh, the appellant's case is tied up in absolute knots as to which or, which or either or any of these contracts it was actually a party to. My learned friend um, took umbrage at our paragraph 19 of our skeleton argument, which said that their case was that they were parties to neither contract A nor contract B. And therefore, we were at a loss to understand what their case was as to how title passed the binding way from them to the ultimate buyer. Uh, and my other friend showed you some part of the, the pleading that uh, indicated that they weren't quite denying they were party to contract B, because they were admitting some allegation that suggested that they were uh, party to contract B. But what he didn't show you uh, was a rather more clear and important part of his own pleading, which is a bundle C tab 16, please. This is the Fairlight re re amended defence and counterclaim. And if I could just ask you to go to page 225, please, which is paragraph 29. you'll see that there, in little b, Fairlight plead explicitly that it did not at any stage become a party to the sub-agency agreement, that's contract A, now in our nomenclature, or a party to the sale agreement, contract B. And the absence of any privity of contract between it and sub uh, means that there's no obligation to rescind dot, dot, dot. Uh, sorry, which was the bit that Mr. Collins relied on? I've just lost my reference. Oh, um, Where he, he, he relied, I think, to 22A, if I'm 22. right. Mr. Collins might correct me. I'm... Sorry, yes, it was 22A and then B, which admits the remainder of, my, of our paragraph 7. Right. Um, and, and if you look at our paragraph 7... Attention, please. Attention, please. This is a security control office. 
You are now invited to observe a two minute silence to mark the anniversary of Armistice Day. Um, that, that, that was, I think, the, the part he, he relied on. But it's even clearer the position of all the other. Sorry, sorry, I'm just cross referring. So his point was uh, seven, eight, 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 A doesn't address whether or not <coughs> Fairlight was party to contract B. Uh, so 22B, say that of course says paragraph 7 is admitted. Which bit of paragraph 7 asserted that Fairlight had entered? Contract was privy to contract B. I can't immediately answer your leadership, I'm afraid. I, I, I right. So you, you say, in fact, fair to fair like deny being party to contract B. So yes. So yeah. what is your answer? What do you do? You maintain your position that on Fairlight's case, title couldn't pass. Your no. paragraph 19 skeleton point. Well, I maintain it in the sense that if they're right about that analysis, then, well, no, they can't be right about that analysis because title power. So I do maintain the point, and it's the correct one, because as on the face of the pleadings, whatever the um, <coughs> portions that you have to go through to find something else that Mr. Collins did, and I'll have to go back to that, I'm afraid, if we need to. There is no doubt that the case they ran at trial was that they were party to neither. And as I said, it's even clearer if you go to their amended reply to our defence to counterclaim, which is at tab 18, and look at, please, paragraph 6, first of all, on page 272, which, and the final sentence of that, where they say, as a matter of construction, it is averred that Fairlight was demonstrably not a party to either the sub-agency agreement or the sale agreement, or to any other contract necessary to conclude a private treaty sale, as alleged by Sotheby's or at all. And then, for good measure, whilst one is pondering what that might mean and how it fits with a case, with any case that's being advanced, one could look at 6, six big A in red over the page at 273, where, by way of amendment, um, Fairlight expressly pleads, it is de they deny that MWO was authorised to bind Fairlight as principal to the sub-agency agreement between MWL and Sotheby's, contract A, or to the sale agreement between Sotheby's as agent for MWL and the buyer, or that MWO did so 
buying Fairlight, whether by reason of any alleged partnership or otherwise. But their case at trial was that they were not part of the contract. And, 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 um, so how could title pass? They, they offered no, as far as I'm aware, there is no explanation for how title passed when they became bound. So one, one asks my lady rhetorically, why was it their case? Because there can't be any doubt that Fairlight had to be party to some part of one or other of those contracts. Now, uh, one thing you can say is their case at least acknowledged that contracts A and B stand or fall together. And we say that was a, that's, a, that's correct, because they established the terms both of the bipartite contract of sale between sellers and buyers, brokered by Sotheby's, and each of the sellers and buyers' respective obligations between <coughs> themselves and Sotheby's. And you have to read them together in order to, to understand how the contract of sale ultimately works. So the criticism that it's wrong to say that title passed by contract A, uh, sorry, that the contract of sale was effective by contract A and contract B is an unfair criticism. What we were saying there was that you need contract A to understand how Sotheby's could bind the buyers to contract B, as well as to understand what the nature of the authenticity guarantee in contract B was. But we weren't saying that contract A passed the title, merely that as a package they achieved everything that needed <coughs> to be achieved. Now, if it's now being accepted, as Mr. Collins was suggesting, that Fairlight was a party to but only contract B, apart from that not being his case as pleaded, um, we would say that, that that represents this sort of artificial, contrived manner in which they are, they are forced to try to carve up what is a package of agreements that are um, meant to be read together, establishing a tripartite contractual relationship, carefully doing so, so that the owner, sellers and buyers don't know who each other is. And in fact, trying to effectively have their cake and eat it. And of course, they, they think they can get rid of the authenticity guarantee problem by only admitting their parties to contract B. I'll come on to explain why that's not so. Um, but it just, their, their plea case certainly made no sense. A contract A was a prerequisite to contract B in the manner I've just explained. Because if you didn't establish the relationship between the sellers and Sotheby's in contract A, <coughs> Sotheby's could never have entered contract B and agreed the terms it did to bind both of them to the buyer and to itself. And it would be, it's doubly odd, if, if I may say, to suggest that Fairlight is only party to contract B, because contract B was the only one of the two that was not signed by one of the sellers, <coughs> that the sellers didn't even see uh, at any point until this dispute arose, that the sellers, it wasn't even concluded when the buyer when the sellers agreed contract A, um, it was precisely the one half of the equation they had nothing to do with at the time. Um, so even if even if Fairlight do move away from their pleading case to say that they were part of contract B alone, then it, it, it still provides no answer really to whether they are obliged to honour the authenticity guarantee. So the um, the correct analysis is either they're a party to both contracts or to neither. Yeah. Um, but your, your, your point is that it's nothing short of irrational to suggest that they could be party to one of them, but not to the other. Yeah. And that it's um, supremely irrational to suggest that if they were only going to be party to one, it would be to contract B. Yes, it, uh, that's probably a fair way of putting it, my lord. Um, of course, they have to be contract Mr. Collins knows they have to be party to contract B at least. Because he has to explain how title passes. Yes, but if but it doesn't make any if sense. It had to be if it had to be only one, and one had to search for some reason as to why it was one but not the other, um, <coughs> then one would start looking at contract A, not contract B. In my submission, you would, because that's the only one the buyer, the sellers actually had contact with. But the main point is that there's no conceivable rational reason as to why it should be one but not both. No, the only reason, or neither. The, the only reason, of course, is that Fairlight wants to avoid. The obvious terms to bind it to something. Talk about rational reasons. Yes, well, there, there you go. Yeah, there's no other rational reason uh, apart from wanting to win the litigation. So, can we just briefly on this particular point look at contract B? Because, um, in my submission, Mr. Collins' submissions, as they've ended up with an acceptance of their parties to contract B, 
as I understand it, leads into quite a, a peculiar position for them. So contract B, I've got it as we know, uh, and I've been using bundle C, call bundle, tab 3, page 59. It's also S1, tab 1, 85. Whichever version your lordships and your ladies have. Uh, it, it, you'll be familiar enough, I hope now, with the document to know that it contains the mixture of terms that I've been talking about already today, namely some of his rights and obligations as principal, including, importantly, for the purpose of giving the guarantee, <coughs> as well as the terms of the contract of sale itself that end up binding the sellers to the buyers and vice versa. I'll come on to the terms in more detail in a moment, but simply accepting at the moment that we are in the world where Fairlight now say they are party to this contract. I ask you to look at the authenticity guarantee on page two under clause four. It begins as relevantly as, uh, as necessary at the second paragraph. Because what, what the contract to which they are party says is this. Notwithstanding the generality of the preceding paragraph, which is the as is, sold as is clause, in the event that Sotheby's determines, that's not, not, not the seller's, Sotheby's, the property is counterfeit, that's an imitation intended to deceive, as your sole remedy, Sotheby's will rescind the sale and the owner will return the purchase price. Now, on my learned friend's case, they are the owner and they are party to this contract. So we are left wondering what it is that Mr. Collins says means he's not bound by the promise in this contract that he, as the owner, will return the purchase price in the events that have transpired. In my respectful position, there is no proper answer to that. And it's important, perhaps, because of what's said about contract A in various ways, that this is not said to be an obligation on the seller, nor an obligation on the consignor, but on the owner. And we know, because it's Mr. Mr. Collins' own case, that both of the owners were parties on, on their new position for this contract. So, In a way, that's the answer to the case, because you've got an admitted obligation, an admitted contract to which he was party, obligation that's as clear as day, requiring them to return the price in the event that Sotheby's determined it's a counterfeit. The wrinkle to that, of course, is the GAV provision appears in this contract, but not in contract A. So I don't say that's the answer that I want you to uh, ultimately get to on the analysis. But it is the analysis of my learned friend's case followed to its logical conclusion. Sorry, why, why do you say that? Why, why do you not want that result? Well, because this, this clause, uh, uh, as your ladyship knows, contains the, the proviso mm -hmm. that requires me to establish the GAV provision isn't, in, isn't operative, whereas the other contract, I say, on my respondent notice point... Yes, but if you, if doesn't. Ignore your respondent, if, if you win on your construction of the GAV clause... Of course. You don't, you, no. Right. So okay. what I would say is that that means, in, in my submission, that leaving the GAV clause to one side, that's, that's it. But none of this is pleaded down, not that's necessarily a point to take in this group. But I mean, this wasn't pleaded below. What was the fair, Fairlight's uh, admission of being a party to contract B was not pleaded, and therefore you did not advance, as it were, a claim under this paragraph. Not in terms, no. Not in terms. No. What, 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 that, you would have done. We would have done, of course. There's a wrinkle to it, of course, which is that uh, we just looked at uh, if I could take you to this, perhaps in the latest question. We just looked at 22A in uh, their reply and defence, their, their re amended defence account claim, page 222, tab 16, I think it is. Um, the think is, is a wrinkle, but uh, it's not clear how it works. If, if we, we, I, I pointed you to little a, and little a says, inconsistently with what we just looked at. It is denied that Sotheby's acted on its own behalf when providing the buyer with a guarantee under the sale agreement. That's contract B. It is averred that Sotheby's was acting as agent and sub-agent on behalf of MWL and Fairlight, respectively, when it provided the guarantee. Now, that is the probably the genesis of the issue of trial as to whether Sotheby's was giving the guarantee as principal or as agent, decided against, against Fairlight, 
not appeal. But it does leave, the, the, the problem it leaves is that if that is correct, then they were a party, at least to a part of contract B, <coughs> by virtue of the agency that they plead in this paragraph. So when my lady says... So that's the bit that Mr Collins is relying on. Well, maybe, but it doesn't get him anywhere near where he needs to be because he's only admitting the guarantee was given on his, his behalf, not that the contract, the rest of the contract was about one to which he was party. I mean, what he does accept and indeed aver is that, I mean, the whole point of the sub-agency is to enable a contract to be concluded at the end of the day between the original principal and the ultimate buyer. Yes, if there was one, if there if, was a sub-agency. Yeah. Yeah, yes, if there was a sub-agency. And so I think he obviously he relies on contract B to the extent that it fulfills that part of the common purpose of the parties, but no further. Well, Whether that's realistic is another matter. It, it's not only unrealistic and irrational, um, perhaps, it's also now exactly the opposite of the way the case was pleaded, as we've just seen. Because below, he said he was a party to neither, except possibly the guarantee was given on their own behalf as and not by, not by Sotheby's itself. Now, the judge rejected that, so we're not in the realms of one worrying about that. But if, if I could ask you just to follow through where that takes you. Their case being that the authenticity guarantee was given by them as principals, sellers to buyer, then even below, they had to be accepting that if the conditions for the invocation of the guarantee in clause B, in contract B, were satisfied, they were under a duty to rescind and give back the money. And one can argue about whether what the mechanism for giving back the money was, and whether it was them having to give it directly to the, to the, to the buyer or buyer Sotheby. But, but, and none of that was, of course, ventilated. But it, and it's rather irrelevant, because the, the, the bottom line is that on its own pleaded case, it, as owner or co-owner, promised in terms to return the purchase price in the event that Sotheby's determined the painting was a counterfeit and all of the other conditions of the guarantee were satisfied. Now Sotheby's, which Fairlight accepts, was its agent in whatever parts of contract B were concluded, has satisfied that obligation and paid back the money to the buyer. And one is therefore asking what is Mr. Collins's reason why he can lawfully refuse, Mr. Boy Fairlight, can lawfully refuse to make good their agent, who has fulfilled on their behalf what is on any analysis their promise, on this pleaded case at least, to pay back the money to the, to the buyer. So one is left uh, with a kind of odd situation, which is that on the pleaded case below, Fairlight is liable for the reasons I've just said. And the fact that Sotheby's has discharged the obligation to pay back the money must mean that um, its principal, Fairlight, on whose behalf it must have done that, is liable to pay the money over to Sotheby's. And on the case that is now advanced, which is the exact opposite of that, namely that there were, were parties to the whole of contract B, but the, guarantee, uh, the, but, but the guarantee must have been given as principal because there's no challenge to the judge's finding that, that, that it was, Fairlight is also liable because it accepts it was the owner, party to contract B, and obliged under contract B to give back the money if the conditions were satisfied. So there's a catch-22, well, they, they, they fall between two stools, effectively. They, whether they change their case or not, their case accepts that they are liable. Just the second one again. The pleaded case below, F liable, C 22A, on the case now advanced, Fairlight is party to all of contract B. What do you say? That when, when one simply reads and applies the terms of the authenticity guarantee in contract B... Owner return the price. Owner will return the price. And what part of that, if the, and assuming all the conditions are satisfied, what is, mis, what is Fairlight's defence to a claim that it now do return the price? So I'm afraid what, what, what one sees in this appeal is a, 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 the smoke screen of sub-agency has been thrown around what is actually quite straightforward and obvious position in my respectful submission. And it has led to 
um, it, it, it led my lady to give permission because there was a litany of, sort of authority points taken, points that, that, that was suggested the judge didn't take into account. But when it, when it all falls out and is properly analysed, um, it goes nowhere at all for Fairlight. And we're not even at the point of asking the proper question, in my submission, which is, did the judge misdirect himself in law or principle, or did he reach a conclusion which was perverse? Mm. And he didn't misdirect himself in law, because, <coughs> I, I, as I hope I've explained, this was not a sub-agency case at all, and that's exactly what he said. And he didn't need to go through the cases to find the answer, as Mr. Collins criticised him for doing. He needed to analyse the pattern, the facts, and decide whether they were within the sub-agency cases. And he properly did the former and decided that they were not. So you don't get into any misdirection question, and you don't, can't possibly suggest that his decision, which is the key decision, was Mark Weiss authorised implicitly or explicitly by Fairlight to enter the contract. You can't possibly suggest that is a perverse conclusion. It's actually the obvious possibly the only rational conclusion on the facts of this case. But when you factor in Mr. Kovitz's evidence, as we discussed at the beginning, it's, 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 it's hopeless. So in a sense, that is privity um, in terms of the principles that I say are at play. Um, You'll have gathered that if, if one tries to put this into the cases my learned friend relies on, the upshot of my submission and the correct legal analysis in my submission is that when you look at Mark Weiss <coughs> and Fairlight, in each case they're in the position at the head of the contractual chain for all relevant purposes vis a vis other bits. So um, in, the, in the context of the Prentice case, um, uh, where you have the brokerage agreements. Find the reference. Uh, yes, so the, we don't need to go, I don't think at the moment it's the same. we need to go to Prentice's three of the bundles of authority. But what, what, what on proper analysis, MWL undoubtedly, and even on my own learned friend's own case as owner, co-owner of the property, MWL has to be in the position of the insured overseas, it's called in that case, at the top of the chain, because it is the party engaging Sotheby's as principal to do work on its behalf. So <coughs> it, it cannot be the producing broker who subdelegates to the placing broker which is a true case of sub-agency. Um, and because the only question is whether, it author whether Fairlight authorises it... Well, what if it's wearing two hats? So with one hat it can't because it's the insurer. What if it's wearing a hat? In, in the relevant sense, my lady. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and on the second way of putting the case, which is the fresh agreements sort of point that you, you posited, uh, on, on, it's only got one hat anyway by that stage. But so for relevant purposes, you, you look at all those cases, and we're in the position of the the owners of the property being at the head of the chain, and Sotheby's being the next run down in direct contractual privity for the relevant purpose. And ditto in the Pioneer Container case, if it's relevant at all, which it's not because it's a case on bailment. But, but we, we are in the position uh, of Fairlight and MWO being the owners of the, con of, of the goods that were shipped, not MWO being the bailee <coughs> who subdelegates the bailment sub -bailey. Just looking briefly, if if, uh, if it's convenient, at, at contract A itself in a few in a, in a little bit more detail because we didn't look at it very much yesterday for, for obvious reasons. It's the bundle C tab three, page fifty four. Um, 
Uh, just to make good the point that whilst it does contain some of the authority provisions that enable Sotheby's to bind the sellers, for the most part it contains what you might call the consignment contract to which the owners of the property as principals towards Sotheby's um, must have been part of. The introduction at page 54, of course, confirms the terms on which you grant to Sotheby's the exclusive right to offer and sell the property for a period of three months. Now, of course, one can always make the point with a contract which, could, which is concluded with an undisclosed or unnamed principle that it doesn't name or refer to the undisclosed or unnamed principle. But that doesn't get you. You have to ask yourself, in my submission, what, what objectively did the parties intend when they said that um, they were granting Sotheby's the right to sell the property for, exclusively for a period of three months? That had to be a, a, an offer, an agreement, a promise made by both owners. Because effectively, it meant that their ability to sell the property was taken out of their hands entirely for three months. They were giving up the right on, on, of the owners of the property to sell it themselves for that period. And that obviously was because Sotheby's contracted for a benefit because it would earn a commission if it could succeed. But my, my learned friend's case is that despite that exclusive arrangement, Fairlight could nonetheless have sold half of the property during this three-month lock-in or lock-out period uh, to, a, to, a, to someone else. How, how could that possibly have been intended? But it has to follow, because if my learned friend, if Fairlight is not bound by contract A, then Mr. Kovitz can go off and take his half of the painting and, and sell it to, uh, consign it to Christie's, or purport to do so, or sell, sell it to anybody else or gift it to his daughter, or whatever you, whatever it may be. And so that's another pointer in, in my submission to the, the fact that we are in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fact situation here where there really is a complete replacement, if you like, of the, of the uh, Mark Weiss agency with this Sotheby's contract, for all intents and purposes, for three months. And that, as we know, even if you get within the sort of agency cases, points you back out of the exception. Um, you've then got clauses like clause one, which in, says that you've instructed Sotheby's to apply for an export license and you'll, you'll provide the relevant documentation. And your lordships and ladyship might ask themselves how Sotheby's might have imagined that um, those documents had something from the legal owner of the, of the painting. Um, and whether Fairlight could realistically expect to be able to refuse to hand over its legal document of title to the painting, and Sotheby's to claim that there's, uh, and to defend a claim for breach of contract by Sotheby's. Mark Weiss can't possibly have intended to promise to hand over documents of title, for example, or evidence of title, uh, without binding the legal owner, because otherwise he'd be left in a position where he might never be able to comply with the promise he was making. What is the form of the legal ownership? of a painting normally takes. My, my lord, I'm, I'm theorizing yes. that... I mean, it's not to say you have a land register. You can go and look, look up anything of that kind. Of course not. But one imagines one has to produce evidence of ownership. Let, well, I mean, you'd expect perhaps they'll have to produce, a, I don't know what, the invoice showing when you bought it and paid the price, yeah. something of that Something of that nature. Well, there's no yeah. document of title as such. No, I don't, I, you're quite right. I shouldn't have said document of title. I suppose evidence of title. Evidence of title, or, yes. or, or at least a document that emanates from the legal owner to show that the yes. legal owner is the one exporting <coughs> the painting. And, and, and imagine if Mark Weiss says, well, OK, that's great, but um, Fairlight's refusing to give it to me. Uh, is, is it seriously said that Sotheby's can't <coughs> complain as against Fairlight? And why on earth would Mark Weiss contract on those sorts of terms? Well, in this case, the original purchase was made by Fairlight. Yes. Fairlight's name only appears on it, yes. but it's entirely uncontroversial. But, um, it was actually a purchase on behalf of both of them. Exactly. <coughs> which might be said to give some colour to the general arrangement that, um, that followed a year later. Yes, it's exactly the same in reverse. And it's not said by my own friend that that was merely the purchase by joint the purchase by one person, and then it's held subsequently as joint uh, on, on 
on trust for them both. He said in terms, I think yesterday, and accepted, that they were both parties to that purchase. They were both bound to the, set, to the seller of the painting by the agency of Fairlight. So it's the exact opposite. And, 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 and again, one just has to ask the practical. Yes, practical. So if, I mean, as we're thinking about whether well, the true contractual arrangement here is two people at, at the first level, then Sotheby's below them, or whether it's a three-tier structure yes. um, in that sort. Yeah. One has the fact that it was undoubtedly a, a, a two-tier structure uh, with the seller at the top and, um, and the two buyers a year previously. Yes. All taken together, that supports my point that it's not only what happened here, but it's notoriously what happens in these kinds of art cases where people don't want their names hmm. associated in all cases with, with the legal documents and the, the, the publicity. But that, that doesn't need to go that far. It's obviously constant. <clears throat> and then you've got clauses like paragraph three, where Sotheby's uh, agrees not to charge a commission, not to take a commission. And I think it's now being said that if Sotheby's did take a commission, Fairlight can complain about that contractually. Um, but more importantly, perhaps in terms of the practicalities, uh, the, 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 the party, the counterparty to Sotheby's acknowledges in clause three that Sotheby's is entitled to charge the buyer, uh, a buyer's commission at a certain price, and to keep it. Now, of course, um, for that to be allowed, if there's a contract of agency, Fairlight would have to give its informed, fully informed consent. Now. And um, there's no suggestion, of course, that Fairlight didn't give its fully informed consent, which it did clearly through the agency of Mark Weiss. And Mark Weiss must have intended him to be authorised to give that consent on the part of both owners, because otherwise Sotheby's face the prospect of one of them coming along saying, I didn't agree to you taking this commission. I want, I, I want it. You acted in breach of duty. Secret profit. A secret profit. Or account maybe not secret, but anyway, <laughs> one you have to account for. Yes. yes. A, a profit made um, in the course without, of our agency. Yes. Yeah. And of course, that, that, that follows because it's accepted now that um, well, it's accepted that sort of this was an agent to, to so you have, if, if the consent isn't binding, if this consent isn't a binding consent given contractually by Fair Life, um, paragraph four, this is quite an important provision. Uh, certainly the very last part of it. I've made the point at the beginning that there, there was obviously going to be terms about instalment dates and amounts and the sort of <coughs> logistics of a consignment that you'd expect to have to be in contract with Sotheby's to agree. But the very final sentence is quite important here. It says, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the seller, the owners, in the event that the prospective buyer fails to pay any portion of purchase price, you agree that Sotheby's has no obligation to enforce payment by the prospective buyer. Sotheby's will not release the property to the prospective buyer until it's received payment of the purchase price in full. Where are you reading from? It's the very final sentence of the bottom paragraph on page 54, Manny, yes. clause 4. It's the final two yes. sentences. Oh, I'm so sorry. Really yeah, two yes. sentences. <laughs> but it's important because it, it shows you that Mark Weiss, on behalf of itself, and we would say their life, obviously, was agreeing, recognising that the enforcement of the buyer's obligations, which will come under the contract B uh, provisions, was a matter for Sotheby's, not for the sellers. And equally importantly, that Sotheby's itself had no obligation in that regard to enforce the contract. The protection that the sellers bargained for was simply that the property would not be handed over until they got the cash in their hands. So that's important in, in, in respect, in my submission, of my uh, respondent's notice point, firstly. I'll come back to that in a moment, because that shows you that um, it can't have been contemplated that a provision in the buyer contract contract B, qualified the um, Sotheby's rights vis-a-vis -vis the sellers in contract A. I'll, I'll elaborate that in a minute. But it's important for the point I want at the moment, because if, if I could ask you to posit that Sotheby's did somehow release the property prematurely, they, had a check, they took a check and it bounced. Well, it doesn't happen really uh, nowadays, but um, let's assume that happened and, 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 and the buyer had got the property prematurely. Could it really be said that Fairlight, as the legal owner of the painting, 
couldn't sue Sotheby's for breach of that clause. If only Mark Weiss could sue, what would Mark Weiss's loss be? On Mr. Collins's case, well, it's lost half the painting. It might, I suppose, have also lost more because it would be liable to Fairlight, but it might not be liable to Fairlight if it was entirely Sotheby's fault. It's not obvious that Mark Weiss would be liable for the default of Sotheby's in prematurely letting go of the painting before payment had been made. But in that case, Fairlight's got no remedy, uh, and Mark Weiss can only claim half the value of the painting. It, it, it's, all, it's all a bit um, absurd, really. Uh, paragraph 5 over the page, 55. Um, th this is important because, although it's not in the authenticity guarantee section, which, as you know, in contract A appears in the annex, the private treaty term, what it, it does touch upon that point because um, it talks about agreeing instalments and deposits. And if I could pick it up on the third line at the top, the top of the page, save that. The first instalment, together with the second instalment if applicable, shall be repayable by you to Sotheby's in full within two days of notification of the occurrence of any one or more of the following. This is the seller of the painting agreeing to give back the deposit to Sotheby's, not to, the, not to the buyer, but to Sotheby's. And those are variously breach, number one, two, loss or damage to the property, and three, this is the important one for present purposes perhaps, any rescission of the sale of the property to the prospective buyer under Sotheby's authenticity guarantee set out in the private treaty terms attached here too. So you not only have the treaty terms themselves, but you have in the body of the letter agreement of contract A, the obligation on, the, on Sotheby's counterparty, to put it neutrally, to give back the deposit if the sale is rescinded under the authenticity guarantee. And my learned friend's case is that that obligation only fit against Mark Weiss and not against it as co-owner and joint owner. And we say that cannot possibly be intended. And the only question is, what, what, did he have authority? Did, did Vice have authority to impose it? Agree with it? He did. You then got the standard sort of terms in paragraph seven, um, uh, clause uh, clause seven. Apart from the agrees to deliver to Sotheby's premises, and then you've got liability for loss and damage. The timing in which Sotheby's takes the risk of loss and damage, and uh, the extent to which. Uh, and it's limited to the maximum amount. Again, um, none of that apparently is binding on Fairlight on my learned friend's case. He has to draw the analogy with the Bayerman case to say, oh, there's, there's a, there is a legal route through which you can hold the sub agent uh, to, to the terms of the sub agency, <coughs> even though part of the principle isn't a part of the contract. But of course, the whole point of the Bayerman case is that they are sui generis. Absent a special legal relationship that enables you to have that conclusion, you're left in a, in a legal vacuum on my learned friend's case, which is that Sotheby's thinks it's contracted to limit its liability to the reserve price, among other things. And, and Fairlight would come, if, if the painting was lost, you can guarantee Fairlight would be the first to come along and say you're liable for the true value, which is 20 million. And then um, finally, paragraph 10 uh, is the clause that actually incorporates private treaty terms. And, and it, the wording of paragraph 10 is quite important in itself, beyond the content of the treaty terms. Because you'll see there the, the second clause on the second line, that those terms form an integral part of your agreement with Sotheby's and the prospective buyer. And that, uh, in my submission, reflects, encapsulates the tripartite nature of this contractual structure. It's a three-way agreement. Sellers to Sotheby's, Sotheby's to buyer, and seller and buyer together. And then you look at the private treaty terms, which the, the sellers are told will be, um, what well, the sellers agree will be included in the sale contract. And again, you've got the exclusion of liability vis-a-vis -vis the buyer <coughs> at the bottom of the first column. Put it, put it neutrally, it's like the exclusion of Sotheby's liability uh, to whoever its counterpart is. And again, 
how can that apply only to half a half an ohm or a half ohm? And then you have the guarantee provision on the second column on the right of page 57 of the core bundle. And um, just to just to be absolutely clear, we're, we're concerned with the notwithstanding paragraph, as you know. And it sets out the four conditions, uh, the three conditions in this case, that, that are required to be satisfied before subsidies can invoke the, the guarantee. Um, or are required to invoke the guarantee. And those conditions do not include the proviso. And it's that point that is the nub of the economic notice. But when, when that, in that guarantee, when the party for the contract agrees with Sotheby's that you shall agree to a rescission of the sale and return the purchase price to the buyer, which is the middle, in the middle line of that first paragraph, um, under notwithstanding, we say it is difficult to conceive that cannot bind both owners of the property. Because if Sotheby's was only being given that promise by one half of the owners, <coughs> or one of the two owners, it, it, it would be make a mockery of the position. So Sotheby's, in all of those ways, is not acting as the agent of anybody in agreeing those terms with the parties to contract A, and therefore not acting as a sub-agent to anybody. I should say, incidentally, if it matters, just to correct something my learned friend said, a sub-agent is not the agent of the principal. If it matters in proper legal analysis, the sub-agent is only <coughs> the agent of the agent. Um, and, it, and it may matter in some of the ways my learned friend puts the case, but if you need authority for that, it's in the authorities bundle extract from Bowsted, paragraph 5-009. But it's quite tempting to slip into the language that a sub-agent is agent of the principal. Um, but it's not. Well, Thank if he were, that would get round the privative problem. Wouldn't it? Well, not uh, no, no, my lord, not necessarily, because that's only looking at the question of whether the authority derives from the principal, <coughs> or whether it derives from the subagent, not whether they're actually in contractual privity. But but anyway, more an aside than anything else. Right. <laughs> okay. Is that the end of your? Well, that was all I wanted to say about the privity point, yes, except if you wanted me to show you the factual sequence of events. But I, I can say, that looking at it, I don't think I've anything to add <coughs> that will help you of your lordship and your ladyship. Um, um, well, if there's any document we haven't seen, which would be helpful to us, I think it might be useful to have that flagged up. But no, I don't think so. But if you do discover that there is one, perhaps you can let us have a note or yes. some, something to that effect. I will. I, I'm, I haven't, it hasn't been suggested to me from behind, so that's a good sign. Um, but if, <laughs> yes. if, if it is, I'll let you know. Can I just, just ask you, though, to focus? We won't go to it, but um, assuming there's no fresh analysis of the kind we talked about earlier, fresh authority, fresh relationship kind of analysis. The 17th of May email, um, S1, Tab 166, yes. is quite important mm. because it says that Mr. Kovitz will be consulted before Mr. Weiss makes a commitment. And I do invite you to consider what the word commitment <coughs> must have meant to the parties at that point. Mr. Kovic wasn't concerned just generally about the involvement of, a, uh, of an, an auction house or an institution like Sotheby's. He was concerned that he was going to be consulted before binding commitments were made. And that can only mean on his behalf, on the seller's behalf, jointly. And I, I do suggest that's an indicia, uh, an indicium, if needed of the nature of the authority that was being given. It was, consult me. Before you make a commitment, I'm happy you can make that commitment. And, I, and, and as he said in cross-examination, as, as, as on your judgment, you see. Well, beyond the documents, then you, you just rely on um, the passage Mr. Collins helpfully drew to our attention in Mr. Covis's cross-examination. Is there anything else in terms of the witness evidence? No, I don't think there is. And, and, and also the, the, um, no, the, the part that I just mentioned in, in, in particular, the, the delegation definition, um, it, it's day three, page 102, line 25. Yes, well, transcript. we've read that. Um, and I, uh, I've mentioned that he had the contract on the day it was signed. <coughs> and at no point until the litigation arose, there was any objection to it. 
Um, in that case, I can think I can finish on the privity point, but I, I, I haven't specifically tackled all of the ways in which my learned friend suggests that the judge omitted to deal with certain bits of the evidence. Um, we, and the reason I don't need to go into that, I think, is that in para 32 of our skeleton, they are all set out seriatim. And they are all misplaced as criticism of the judge. Taken as a whole, it's very clear the judge looked at all the relevant evidence and directed himself up to the authority. So, that privity, I don't think I need either to say very much more about the respondent's notice point, because that stands and falls with my submission that Fairlight and Mark Vice Limited were both parties as principals to contract A, as the judge found, with Sotheby's, on the other hand, giving, giving the guarantee. Now, if that is right, then um, the proviso in contract B, which is an additional proviso qualifying the right to rescind in the case of a counterfeit, was clearly for Sotheby's <coughs> protection only in its relationship vis-a-vis -vis the buyer. It narrowed the circumstances. Sorry, six, seven, eight, eight, eight. The proviso in contract B, the GAV proviso, was clearly for Sotheby's protection, primarily in the sense that it narrowed the scope of the authenticity guarantee by, may, by enabling Sotheby's to refuse to give its money back, even if it's a counterfeit, if, it, if the painting happened. It was nonetheless sold in accordance with the description that that it should have been at the time, put it like that. In, in other words, if Sotheby's had done, the, done a proper, done properly, properly assessed the generally accepted views and described it in accordance with those views, or <coughs> if it had specifically noted a divergence of views, then Sotheby's and the buyer agreed that Sotheby's wouldn't be able to force a rescission, uh, and that the buyer wouldn't be able to force a rescission, and that Sotheby's wouldn't have to. And that, that, um, gave Sotheby's the right, of course, to require the seller to pay back the money in the circumstances in contract A, which were satisfied, didn't include the GAP provision, even if it had, all, not, notwithstanding that, it had also agreed to narrow its obligations towards the buyer by the GAP provision in contract B. Well, as, as a matter of construction, how is it argued below that the GAV proviso was to be read into contract A? How is it argued as a matter of construction? Uh, I don't think it was, my lady. I don't think it was ever an issue. Because it was, it, we, we, were, we were saying our rights vis-a-vis -vis the, the sellers are encapsulated, in this regard, in the authenticity guarantee, are encapsulated in contract A. And all well, we you're, not saying, you're not saying that you were part of the contract B. Oh. Well, we were for some purposes. Yeah. But, contract but not Contract B, Sotheby's and yes. Yes, with the buyer. Yes. No, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly elusive dichotomy here. We are saying that Sotheby's is in the middle. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's going to give account an authenticity guarantee. And it tells the sellers that they will be obliged to give their money back if three conditions are satisfied. Yes. They don't include the gap. Yeah. Sotheby's goes off and, and includes that in the contract with the buyer. Mm -hmm. But Sotheby's also adds in the contract with the buyer the gap provision. So my question is, how is it argued below that, uh, sorry, that, that, I mean, when I said you, I meant, I wasn't talking about yeah. Sotheby's, I was talking about MWN and Fairlight. Um, yeah. <laughs> forgive me. When, um, how was it argued that the GAV provisor was to be read into contract A? I think one has to start by saying, you, first of all, obviously you have to assume that they are party to one or both contracts. And they would, they would have had to say, and I wasn't there, so I'll be correct if I'm wrong, they like, will have had to say, if we are wrong about our primary case that we weren't party to either, then we, as we as pleaded, gave the guarantee as principal, and it was only the one in contract B. 
who did the Gallic Revival. Because they would have they would disavow even being party to Contractor. They were on the premise that they were wrong on their on their principal submission, that they were party to neither contract. Um, this was argued on the basis that they were only party to contract B, because that contained a gap. We argued, no, 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 you've got it the wrong way around. If you, you were party to both, you were party to both, but party to contract A, primarily vis-a-vis -vis subjects for this purpose. And that contract does not include the GAV. <coughs> if we're right about that, then GAV doesn't arise, but the judge had already decided the GAV, the GAV point in our favor, and therefore he didn't decide the respondent's notice. But there's nothing in the language, if you, as we've looked at uh, contract A, my lords and my ladies, it makes, even suggests that the, the right of Sotheby's to require the seller under the terms of contract A to buy back the paint, uh, to, to, to take, pay back the purchase price and to take back the painting is somehow contingent on <coughs> Sotheby's being under an obligation in the entirely separate and hither, at that point as yet not concluded contract with a buyer. Uh, to procure such rescission. And because of the clause I showed you about uh, in contract A, whereby Sotheby's agreed with the sellers, that Sotheby's was not under any obligation to enforce the contract, it can't possibly be said that the seller, the Fairlight and, and MWL, had any right to invoke that further condition against Sotheby's or, or require Sotheby's to invoke it against the buyer. It was entirely within Sotheby's discretion to decide whether to invoke it against the buyer. And um, that's why we have done everything that we were required to do by our contract A vis-a-vis -vis Fairlight and Mark Lyon, to trigger their obligation to pay that money. That's the bottom line. No matter what we agreed with the buyer separately. And, and we say that's confirmed by the nature of contract A and B and their functional separation, because they are intended to operate separately without the sellers and the buyers being in contact, knowing each other. And in fact, without, as it turns out, the sellers even knowing the terms, full terms. But it may not matter, but that's why you're saying two different things. There have been sections of your submission saying they're all part of a package. Um, and now you're saying they'd be treated entirely separately. <coughs> Is there a tension there? No, my lady, because... The, the, the package is required to enable the transaction to start and finish, with title passing in one way and money back in the other. But the, um, and they have to be a package and they have to set up that authority to do that. But it's entirely separate, there are two entirely separate relationships that they form. One between the sellers and, and Sotheby's in contract A, <coughs> and the other between Sotheby's and the buyer in contract B. And so if you do look at it as a triangle, they are joined at the bottom by the fact that the sellers and buyers are in a contractual uh, relationship. That's the package point. But each side of the triangle, of the pyramid, are distinct, functional, separated relationships between seller and sub and buyer and sub And they want contract B because it's got the proviso in it, but it's obvious in my respectful submission that contract A is the one that governs the relationship with the sellers. Anyway, um, I, I would say that's reflected, incidentally, in clause one of contract B with the buyers, because that requires payment to be made to Sotheby's, or not to the sellers. And, and Sotheby's has the remedies in contract B for any default, not to the sellers. Now, it is a slightly peculiar position one ends up with, where you have linked agreements which in the normal way, I would say, obviously have to be construed together. But in fact, they, they have these, this built-in sort of separation. Yes. Whereby, as you say, the, the sellers don't know anything about the buyers and vice versa. Or yeah. at least that's the intention. Whether it actually works in practice may be another matter. Um, so one has to bear that in mind when listening to submissions. It all forms part of a single cohesive contractual <laughs> Whole to be construed cohesive might cohesively. Be, yes, might be a. It, it's a difficult relationship to untangle. Of course, that's yes. why we're here, actually, because it's there. There are complexities to it, 
I mean, it's all driven, no doubt, by the understandable, or at least perhaps often understandable, desire of parties to keep a low profile, if I can put it that way, and not, not be named on the face of documents, or at least not have their identity more widely known than is absolutely essential. Yeah. But if I'll just, uh, just to finish on the respondent's notice point, to pick yeah. that up, just to, look, just to look at it commercially, and just to ask whether it all fits commercially, it clearly does on two levels. One, one is that um, Sotheby's clearly wants to be able to agree a set of terms with the sellers and a set of terms with the buyers, and to have a discretion or a flexibility as to when it is obliged to um, rescind a sale, if you like, because some of the counterfeit. But to, to, be, to, 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 to ensure itself that vis-a-vis -vis the seller, when it decides it's rescinded, there's not a big argument about, about whether the generally accepted views were this, that, or the other. Mm. What Sotheby's contracted for with this slightly different um, asymmetrical relationship is that once it had decided with the, the buyer that it was going to rescind because it was a counterfeit, and its reputation was on the line, after all, for selling a counterfeit, Never a, never a happy situation for someone like Sotheby's to be in. Once it had decided that that was its duty, or arguably its duty, towards the buyer, the last thing Sotheby's would have wanted, objectively speaking, commercially speaking, is to say to the seller, we've now going to invoke the terms of your contract A and find itself confronted with a massive debate about the generally accepted views of experts and scholars. What Sotheby's rightly contracted for was a clean cut if we'd rescind, you must give, give the money back. And those three conditions in the contract A are satisfied, and they are. And that makes sense. And with Sotheby's reputation, when you factor in the second reason why it's commercially sensitive, uh, it's the, it's the, it goes back to the fact that Sotheby's balance sheets on the line with the um, authenticity guarantee, as the judge found. Because Sotheby's is bound to the buyer personally, as principal, to pay back the money in the event that contract B is satisfied, <coughs> Um, Sotheby's puts its own money on the line and then has to turn around and look at the seller to be made good. Yeah. Um, and if it does that, obviously it takes a risk, therefore, <laughs> that the seller's got no money, the seller's disappeared, the seller's ceased to exist as a legal entity. They're all the reasons why Sotheby's get paid for this transaction, uh, because it's taking a risk. But what the, the last thing um, it has bargained for in those situations is that the seller can turn around and argue about the generally accepted mm. views of scholars. Because that's what happened here uh, to great cost and expense. Right. Um, that's privity. Can I then go on to deal with partnership? Of course, I don't need both. Either will do. Yes. Um, my learned friend focused his fire on partnership um, for whatever reason. Um, but in my submission, this is a good alternative case, and I maintain it. Um, of course, what it, it effectively supplies the answer to the authority question in a different way. Um, and when you actually look at the uh, judgment, we, we do say the judge made no error of law or principle and, and made no misdirection. And he came to a conclusion he was entirely title to reach on the evidence that you have seen and heard, including the oral evidence. Uh, and he sets out his reasons succinctly, very succinctly in places, but adequately, because you, we know, you can see what his, what his reasoning is. You can see why he says there's a partnership. And it's interesting that the principal ground of appeal here is actually adequacy of reason, not the substance of the decision. And it's put that way, even though in my submission this is nothing like the case cited in support of that part ground appeal, the symmetric case, which my Lord, Lord Justice Peter Jackson will, will recall. We're not in that territory here. And might I just say in the judge's defence here that in fact the, the judge didn't really decide the partnership point as such mm. at all. He express, expressly says, I don't need to decide it. If I had done, I would have favoured Sotheby's. That, in a sense, is a specific decision that he's not deciding. It's now become the first ground of appeal for, perhaps, because it's the easier target of all of the others. But you can excuse, in my submission, a judge 
not going into elaborate detail when he makes that comment. It, you might even say it's not part of his ratio. But if you're well, it's if, 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 sorry. If, if, yeah. it's not. It's not so, part of his ratio. Right. But um, it, in a sense, um, if you're saying he didn't decide it, then you'd probably want a respondent's notice well, um, to, say, to say that he, he should have decided. Yes. That he, <laughs> well, what's happened, my lord, is that we've got into a slightly reversed situation because they've appealed something that wasn't decided, and we've answered the appeal. When we could, if they hadn't appealed it, we could and maybe would, would have put in a respondent's notice and had the same argument. In my submission, that is a formal oddity about the case, but they've treated it as a decision. I say it wasn't actually a decision, but that does explain why the judge dealt with it as briefly That's as he did. That's relevance for you. Yes. In terms of the adequacy of reasoning. It's yes. explaining. Yes, exactly. Um, and so you are in a situation where you've got to, you have to find a misdirection in law or a perversity of conclusion. And actually, Mr. Mr. Collins' submissions went quite a lot wider and deeper than those in the grounds of appeal and in the skeleton argument that he adopted. Um, the, the, the principal criticism in terms of misdirection of law boils down to the fact that the judge didn't quote the statutory test in section one of the Partnership Act 1890. Um, those dozen words that, that we are all very familiar with, carrying on a, carrying on a business in common with a view to profit. Um, it's not actually then said that he didn't ultimately apply that test in substance. It is, that is what's said. Well, I, it, so he didn't grapple with those three elements, and we can see he didn't grapple with it, because if he had grappled with them, he couldn't possibly have reached the conclusion that they were met. Well, in that case, in my submission is that he did right. grapple with them. Uh, and he didn't need to set them out in terms, of course, because it's mm -hmm. common ground what the test was. It's mother's milk what the test is. He was inundated with submissions on uh, the meaning of the partnership act and the, the, the extracts from the statute. And he clearly had them very well in mind when he did go through his reasoning in that section of the judgment, because he sets out the fair light position, as my learned friend properly showed you, in, in his judgment of power 26, which is the counterpoint to the, it's the negative proposition, if you like, to the, to the one that is the, the, the test. <coughs> Where they what he's is effectively saying in Power 26 is, were rather than Fairlight and MWO carrying on a joint business with a common view to profit, were they, as Fairlight say, carrying on a separate business wholly independent? And it's just the flip side of it. And of course, he refers to the Partnership Act in Power 29, and <coughs> the test in Section 2.1, or the, the set of rules in Section 2, that my learned friend showed you somewhere. You can't get to Section 2 without knowing what Section 1 says. Um, and the judge on, on certainly here can be forgiven for not setting it out in, in, in terms. So the question actually is really, as perhaps as my lady said, directed to the alleged failures to consider the evidence as it applies to the three elements of the test. Um, and we set those out at length in response to what they are set out, I should say, first of all, in, in my learned friend's skeleton, Power 28. And again, th those were. Um, referred to by my lady, uh, Lady Justice Carr, in her permission um, approval. Um, but we have answered them all, again, seriatim, in para 32 of our skeleton. And I don't propose to go through them all one by one, because, because it's just, it would just be repetitive. But the suggestion, if, that, if it is intended to be made by para 32 of my learned friend's skeleton, that those pieces of evidence were uncontested, which is the point made in para 32. Um, is plainly wrong. Those pieces of evidence were not, certainly not all, uncontested. And every, there was a hot debate, as you can imagine, as to the nature of the meaning of parts of that evidence and, and, and its effect on the partnership act test. So we deal with them, um, it's in fact in paragraph, paragraph 35 of, uh, of our skeleton, yes. from page 13. And I'll yes. invite your lordships and ladyship to read those again, uh, should they matter. And I pick up instead some of the points my learned friend made yesterday, orally, um, many of which were, I noted, for the first time points made, but, but perhaps none the worst of that, um, as well as a, a selection of some of the points that, that do bear a, a little bit of focus, even though they're in the skeleton. Now, he started yesterday, Mr. Collins, with the new point, or newly expressed point, at least on this appeal, as well, I can that something is to be read into the fact that Fairlight wasn't a trading company, 
and that this was an art dealer client relationship rather than a partner relationship in a common business. Now, I can leave the trading point because um, that, that didn't go anywhere. But it, it, to, the attempt to recharacterize or to characterize the relationship of art dealer and client it is, we say, not correct. And it's certainly not relevantly correct. Because for the purpose of this transaction, the purchase and sale for a profit of the Franz Hubs, they were undoubtedly not acting as art dealer and client. Um, now, they had undoubtedly been art dealer and client in the past, and Mr. Kovitz was one of Mr. Weiss's good clients in the past, as the evidence shows. But they'd also been in business together buying art recommended by Mr. Weiss and financed by Mr. Kovitz, seeking to sell, <coughs> and in many cases apparently succeeding in selling those paintings and sharing the profits between them. And we saw, I think, paragraph 53 of Mr. Weiss's first statement one less one cut five, page one six two, where he specifically noted in the evidence that Fairlight itself adduced that the dealings with the house were in line with the previous practice of buying on the vice recommendation with with COVID's financing and selling for a profit that they then share. My own friend said that this house was the first such arrangement by reference to an email. In other words, a piece of evidence in, in the case. But in my submission, that's not consistent with the, that paragraph of Mr. Bice, 53, which his client used to trial as true. I cannot disavow. But it, it doesn't particularly matter because we're, we're, we all now agree that a partnership can uh, be constituted in relation to a single uh, adventure. But. So, in that uh, recollection, in that paragraph, um, Mr. Weiss doesn't say he ever bought a co-owned painting with Mr. Kovitz or Fairlight, does he? I don't think he does, my lady. So it's just the, the previous dealings were quite partner, he said, but not there was a previous co-ownership. Well, what he said is we would purchase the painting as partner. Page 162. Mm -hmm. well, I'd, I'd rather take it that they were jointly buying part of the painting together. But... That is what the evidence says. It's certainly consistent with that. I mean, maybe nobody needed to give much thought to the precise nature of the ownership of the painting. I mean, the money comes, no doubt, by way of loan from Mr. Kovitz or his company. And the picture, no doubt, goes straight into Mr. Wise's sort of strong room, or at least whatever, as agreed between them. But yes, in much the way it happened here. Yes, indeed, yeah. Um, the fact that it's one party buying it its name, I didn't stop it becoming joint. joint yeah. but what was pleaded here was it that it was a partnership in relation to this transaction? Yes, yes. We, we, that was paragraph eight A, I think. Of yes. Mr. Yes. I, mean, I just wanted to check yes. that you were you were. Both we're we're at item on that. Yes, that's right. And then that's fine because, uh, as far as my case is concerned, Noel, because of course I only have to show it's a partnership in relation to this painting, uh, not any wider partnership. But I would, I do, I do say that it's relevant when you're asking about the nature of this relation. And in particular, to answer the point, uh, were they dealing with each other, quay, art, art dealer, and client, which is my learned friend's case, you do have, you, it is relevant to ask, well, in the past, they weren't doing that. They have that hat. They each have that hat. But they weren't doing it as a matter of course when they were buying and selling paintings for profit. That's my, that's my point. Mm. Um, Mr. Kovitz's evidence was that there was a wide variety of practices in relation to individual purchases. Um, the accounting system was a fairly, um, it varied from, from picture to picture. And yes. Yes. And so it may be I couldn't make out a partnership in relation to some of the other pictures, but luckily I don't have to. Um, no, but it's hard. All that matters. But, but it's probably harder to do so in relation to a single transaction. I, I wouldn't accept <laughs> that, my lord, um, because it all depends. Well, Yes, but it, it, the reason I say it's harder is because you don't need a partnership mm. for a single transaction. I mean, the benefit of a, of a partnership as a business model, mm. I would imagine, is, is, is because of the, um, the consistency and confidence that it gives over a period of time as one of the aspects of partnership. Well, it, it's a, it is a factor, I accept. In my submission, that's <coughs> consistent with Mr. Weiss's evidence. But in fact, although it's not my case that it was a partnership all along, 
uh, it, 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 it sounds very much like it was. That was their practice. They would purchase together, they would sell for a profit, and they would divvy it up more or less equitably, equally. Anyway, I, all, all I'm saying is I don't have to go that far. No. But the evidence does support the suggestion that it was of a similar nature in the past. Well, it could, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. It could just as well be a series of ad hoc <laughs> joint ventures. Perhaps. <laughs> so in other words, we need to look at the facts of this yeah, particular yeah. Um, uh, piece of business. If I can do that. Um, but but I'm, I'm, I'm still on the question of whether they were acting in this venture. Uh, forgive me for interrupting, but one is on my mind. Was Mr. Kovitz cross-examined about his denial of the partnership? Yes. Uh, and it's in so, there. He was. Uh, I, I, can I come back yes, to the reference? Yes, yes. <clears throat> and he, he, he maintained his denial. Yes, but in the, in the passage that, um, uh, that the judge described as, as guarded, um, he yeah. gave quite a long answer about what he understood by the use of the word partner. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, I've read that. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, and um, I'll, I'll give you the reference in a moment. Thank you. So this, this for it. Thank you. Um, and it's relevant, of course, because we're here in an appeal court that the judge heard that evidence and made of it not very much, apparently or at least accepted that he was guarded and wasn't being frank with the court, perhaps, as to uh, what he really thought the relationship was. But you can, you can only go so far with that, because the judge had the unique benefit of hearing Mr. Kovitz, and, and we don't. But I'm, I was actually on the quite narrow point, really, that Mr. Collins makes that this was not a dealer-client relationship. It wasn't. And not for, the, not for the joint purchase of the house and looking to sell it for a profit. You can't actually... It doesn't actually make any sense on the agreed facts of the case to think that in that venture, I would say business, I don't what it is, but they were in separate businesses. One, one the business of an art dealer and one the business of an investor or client. And somehow they brought this together without being in a joint business. But really, in my submission, it doesn't make much sense when you analyze it. They were clearly acting in common. They were clearly intending to make a profit from the venture, and they were clearly in a business together because it was a business relationship where one party brought one part of it, one, one expertise, one type of expertise to the partnership, this device's art, connoisseurship, and knowledge, and another partner brought the money to the table, if you like, which is not an, not an unusual um, setup for a partnership. And we say they were clearly acting together with their relevant expertise and with their intention to make a profit from that common endeavor, which, of course, they did in spades. Um, Mr. Collins said it was important by reference to Section 29 of the 1890. That's, that's, that's the provision that requires accountability for profits by partners made from partnership property. Um, it, he's, he used that as a sort of, sort of launch pad to say it's very important that partners know the scope of the partnership. Um, because, of, because of, in particular, he said, Mr. Weiss was in a, a possibly competing business with the partnership. Um, that's partly right as a submission, but mainly wrong in, in, in my submission. It's clearly right that you should be able to identify the partnership business. But you can obviously identify the partnership business here. It was very limited. I mean, the fact that it was limited helps the identity. It can't stray beyond the dealings with the house. And so in some ways, the, 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 the narrower concept of partnership rather proves that point. No one was under any illusion as to what they were doing with the house. It was a common endeavor with a view to a joint profit. And it's not quite right that Mr. Weiss was in a competing field, actually. You'll, you'll have seen the evidence that I think um, my Lord, Lord Justice Peter Jackson referred to, that Mr. Weiss's speciality was Tudor and Stuart portraiture. That's to say, English art from those periods. Whereas this work was a, obviously a Dutch Golden Age master outside the Vice Gallery's main, main area of interest or, or entire area of interest. There's actually the evidence I think um, my Lord was thinking about there with Mr. Kovitz's witness statement 1, paragraph 11, bundle S1, tab 2, page 133, where he makes it clear that this arrangement was actually designed to enable the partnership or the, the business, the, the, the pairing, uh, to go outside Mr. Weiss's actual normal, normal business area. 
And the accounting for the profit that it comes with a dealing of, with partnership property under Section 29, of course, is, is absolutely consistent with my case. Because even, well, even on Mr. Collins's approach, without a partnership, Mark Weiss was Fairlight's agent. And therefore, if Mark Weiss made profits out of the agency relationship that weren't authorised by the principal, it was already, Mark Weiss was already under a fiduciary duty to account for them. And so the partnership doesn't actually change the way Mark Weiss would have to deal with the property. So um, all of that is entirely consistent with the partnership. Mr. Collins' other main point, which again I think is a new one compared to the grounds of appeal and fidelity, um, was that the partnership is one pleaded as it is as having arisen from the outset of the purchase of the painting. And it arises, we say, from the circumstances of the purchase of the painting and from, the, from that moment forward. Whereas he said one of the things that is inconsistent with partnership is the fact that um, it was possible that Fairlight might still buy Vice out of the painting, like buy the painting from Vice or from the partnership later. Uh, and Mr. Kovitz might hang it on his wall, as he put it. That, he says, points away from partnership. In fact, in my submission, it's entirely equivocal, actually, because all it shows you is that there was, um, well, first of all, there's nothing inconsistent between the evidence that Mr. Kovitz might, if the profits weren't sufficient from his venture, decide to buy the painting from the partnership. There's nothing inconsistent with that uh, and the judge's conclusion that it still was a partnership. It's perfectly possible and rational for all the partners to say, well, let's, get, let's go into this venture together to make a great profit from this thing, whether it's an, an object, a piece of property, or, or an idea, whilst simultaneously agreeing that if it, all, if, it, if it does not work out, one of them will be able to buy out the other. What it's actually effectively doing is saying that we, it's giving, by express agreement at the outset, one of the partners the option to dissolve the partnership, pack up the shop, and take the property and divide it according to their original agreement, which is, which is what it comes to. Because Mr. Kovitz certainly, uh, in, in his own evidence, uh, I'm thinking in particular, you don't need to look at it, but paragraph 62 of his first statement, page 136, one, he was certainly, uh, the, the, the arrangement was certainly that they hoped to make profit, initially, as you know, from the Louvre buying the work. But if, if in fact, the Louvre didn't buy it, or the, the, and there wasn't anyone else to whom it could be sold for any decent profit, then Mr. Kovitz might come along and buy it out. But buying out partnership property in the event the object fails is hardly inconsistent with partnership. You're going to be dealing with a lot, a, a lot of partnerships at, at Sotheby's if, um, if this was a partnership. I mean, practically any jointly owned property that was um, that was brought bought with a view to possible sale, and then it gets, ends up getting consigned to you. And what's special about this? Well, this case as as being partnership. In in a sense, my lord, um, it, it's it's utterly irrelevant how often this happens, because actually the consequences are not at all surprising. The consequences are that the partners are bound to Sotheby's uh, as uh, together. <coughs> Uh, as you would expect from all of the submissions I've made this morning on the agency side. As far as Sotheby's is concerned, this, is a, this would give rise to no particular oddity no, at all. It's no. completely unnecessary. It's, a, it's, 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 it's something that came in as a side, as, as a side issue. Um, I mean, for example, the, the judges did dealings with this. I appreciate partnership is objective. It's not necessarily what people think. But um, uh, Mr. Um, Kovitz gave what might be thought to be pretty rational reasons in his evidence why he wouldn't want to get into a partnership with Mr. Weiss, um, which the judge doesn't seem to deal with apart from saying that he thought Mr. Kovitz was a bit guarded. Yeah. Well, he assessed the evidence and decided that those reasons... It doesn't, I mean, it's a, it's, a matter of, yeah. it's a matter of mystery to us as to what he made of, um, of, of one businessman's perfectly reasoned um, statement that this would be one reason why he wouldn't be a partner. So, I mean, it's simply not dealt with. Well, uh, and you have my submission on why there's brevity on this point. And, 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 
And what do you say about the rather obvious points that if there was a partnership, why don't we find a partnership bank account? Why are there no partnership accounts drawn up? Why is the final divvying up done in a way which doesn't reflect the 1890 Act? Well, what or at least not obvious to say. What I say about that, Michael, is this was very informal, a very informal arrangement. There is no mm. the, the, the point about a partnership, of course, as, as we all know, is that it is it, it, it springs into life if the statutory conditions exist. Passing through these gentlemen's heads is nothing to do with the 1890 Act, nothing to do with having to account for profits under Section 29 or anything like that. The question is, did they, did they intend to form a relationship that satisfies the substantive requirements? Yeah, and of course you can stumble into a partnership without realizing it. But yeah. we're dealing here with two experienced businessmen, hard-headed businessmen, one must assume. And on the face of it, surprising that they should without either probably deliberately intending it, and ended up as partners in relation to this single transaction. Well, um, it begs the, all, all of that rather begs the question what they did intend. Well, I'm sorry, if what I they intended yes. was a relationship, <laughs> the substance of which yes. was a common business sharing profits, I can only keep repeating that in my submission the facts do fit that pattern. Then will the judge found them, partners, and yes, you, 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 your, your lordship may disagree with that, and um, you know, we, we, we're not, we, can, we can all see where where we're going with this. But the, the, the attack has to be either that the judge misdirected himself, or that he reached a perverse conclusion. Yep. And I just do invite you to focus on those rather than retrying the point. Mm. Um, because there, there, were, there were an abundance of factors that entitled a judge, reasonably acting and directing himself under Section 1 of the Act, to conclude this fell on the right line of partnership. And the wrong line of That's all I'm saying. Um, and we do say it's consistent with the language in this witness statement that Fairlight itself abused. I don't need to go back over that. Paragraphs 53, 123, and I think 126 of Mr. Vice's first statement, at page 168 of Fundal S1. We haven't perhaps read. Those are important, not just because Fairlight adduced them as their own evidence. For which documents? Uh, Mr. Weiss's witness statement, my lady, the first one, at Fundle S1 tab 5. The reference is 53, 123, and 126 in particular. In that. Sorry, S1 tab 5. Page 162, 167, and 168, at paragraphs 53, 123, and 126, at least one of which I don't think we've looked at. I just asked you to look at it. It's not a point here that the word partner is mentioned by Mr. Vice and they adopt the evidence that includes it. That's not the point I'm making, mm. although it's relevant. The, the real point is that Fairlight adopted his description of the relationship in his own language in their entirety by adducing the statement. They're bound to accept that description, that evidence of his, as his truthful state of mind at the time in question. And the concepts that that descriptive narrative of their relationships convey in his statement, which they accept, do in my submission encapsulate entirely the statutory criteria for partnership. And it's consistent with the references in the, um, the emails to Mr. Codis as a partner. Um, the spreadsheet, my lord, which was the last part of your question a moment ago, uh, nothing surprising at all about that. Mm. You, you've got an, an informal partnership alongside the trappings of an otherwise informal relationship where people are buying wine for one another, um, they spent money doing this, that and the other. And these two gentlemen, not being accountants, lawyers or anything like that, decide to reconcile it in one big sheet. There's no question that spreadsheet is an accounting of the expenses incurred on the Franz house and the profits made therefore on the Friends House, and there's no question that those profits were in fact split 50-50 with a bonus of 100,000 to Mr. Vice because he got a particularly good price on behalf of the sellers. And that's all that, I, all that one would expect to see in a partnership. The fact that it is mixed up or a lot, placed alongside Mr. Vice's dealings on, on separate issues, and the, and the maths is done so that there's not more than one payment at the end of the day is actually by, completely beside the point. Mm. 
I'm just trying to think this through. So, um, for reasons which one can understand, uh, you don't. Was it? Was there any objection to Mr. Rice's statement going in as hearsay? What happened? It was served under. Why did he? He wasn't. Nobody required him to. It, it was served, of course, when Mark Rice was fighting the litigation. Yes. yes. There was yes. then a settlement. Yes, and then I'm. So no one was calling. You can, you can. Another party can yes. rely on it. Yes. And Fairlight adduced it entirely, along with. I think they introduced other evidence of that nature. But no, um, they subpoenaed other people, in fact. I, I see. Know. Well, Mr. Collins can, can, so far as it matters, just pure curiosity, what was the, why would Fairlight rely on Mr. Rice's statement? On the GAV clause? Yes, there was, of course. It, fundamentally. That, that, was, that was seen as the benefit for Fairlight. At Fairlight. least that was the benefit, yes. Yeah. Mm. Right, so but the benefit was mm. Mr. Rice on GAV. The detriment was Mr. Rice on partnership. Yes. From Fairlight's perspective. Yes, but, but of course, what Fairlight could have done and didn't do was pick and choose. So it was open to it, so I rely on this paragraph, that paragraph, and that paragraph. Uh, and I've certainly done that in a trial, and it's perfectly. Can you do that? Well, it, I did, and it was allowed by the trial judge. <laughs> so, okay. uh, Mr. Collins has done it, he averted right. to it, I think. Yes. And then what the judge sort of says, well, it's here, so it's for me to put what weight I want on it. And yes. Yes. Yes, of course, that Mr. Smith rightly reminds me that there's also a procedural consequence that yep. goes for putting it in. Yep. Mm. Uh, I think it's 32.9. Yes. It's, um, it's where if, if, if you don't call a witness or serve the statement for, the other side can apply to cross examine right. without being bound, therefore, to subpoena and yep. examine in chief. But that's not what they did. They didn't do that. They could have applied. I don't think they applied. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith said he'll deal with that. <laughs> um, but, but, but they didn't do that. The, the only point is that they, what, what's happened is you can treat Mr. Weiss's witness statement as if it had been adduced entirely on behalf of Fairlight, a matter of evidence of the procedure, uh, and, they are, uh, and as if Mr. Weiss was their witness. That means they cannot impugn the truth. Uh, and they, they, they can say he's made a mistake. They can say, well, when you construe his word, what he really meant was this, perhaps. Or his words don't amount to much. Or his words don't amount to much. Exactly. But what they can't do, in my submission, is say the concepts he describes, using whatever words he's chosen, are not his true belief as to the concepts in play in the relationship that he's describing. So that's, that's, that's the point I'm making. And so when Mr. Weiss comes along and says, we were partners for the sale of this painting, it was joint, then joint business with a view to common profit. I'm certainly paraphrasing and not saying that's what he says in exact terms. But when, when he says we were partners and, and this profit was being shared, Fairlight is stuck with that as his genuine belief as to the nature of their relationship. And, and I say, take away the word partner and put, it, put another word in its place or just delete it. The concepts he's describing are a Business in common with a view to joint. He doesn't ever say that they're neither side. Well, obviously, it's the case, it's, um, but he doesn't say we sat down and we had a telephone conversation and we agreed the terms of the partnership. No, it's, it, there's, there's, we're not missing anything. No, like that. no you're not. You're not. He says what came out of their arrangements for the purchase yep. was an understanding. Was what had gone before a partnership, a partners splitting the profit. Yes. Okay. So really, if if that's right, then. There can't be any serious dispute they were in business. This wasn't, this, wasn't, this wasn't fun and games. It was a proper business venture designed to make them money in a, in a, in a difficult world to, to make lots of money, unless you were lucky. And they thought they'd found a three million euro painting that could be sold for much more. Uh, and their business was to try and capitalize that, leverage it, use Mr. Weiss's experience, come up with a lovely catalogue, convince the Louvre that it was the piece that really slotted into their collection that, Made it um, made it worth their while buying it, and they set out to make a profit from that. And, uh, we are where we are. The only final point I need to make on on, on, on partnership, perhaps, um, having mentioned the spreadsheet, or well, I should say on spreadsheet, my lady, it, it's relevant and, and possibly important, as I think my lady, lady Justice Collins noted, that once you have established that there is a sharing of profit from the business, that is prima facie evidence of partnership. 
So we're not, once we, if we, if and when, as we say, we get to that point, Mr. Collins has to rebut that prima facie conclusion. And um, that, that may be relevant. Yeah, thank you. And finally, I, I, the, the, other, the other big point that loomed on partnership was the charge. It certainly loomed large in the documents for the appeal, slightly less large in Mr. Collins's exposition, but um, it's tied in with this idea of an indivisible interest, or at least as the judge found, which he clearly, what, what he clearly meant by was neither could go off and sell their hog during the period of the agency, at least with some of or during the period of partnership, uh, because to do so would thwart the partnership objective, or the joint objective, if it's not a partnership. And, and clearly the judge was right about that. They couldn't go off and sell independently their hog and scupper the other, par other partner or the other party's um, ability to deal with it. Um, it, it. What would have happened, for example, if Mark Weiss had consigned the property to Sotheby under these arrangements, only to find Fairlight, as I said earlier, gifted or sold his, its half to a third party? The fact that they could, couldn't possibly have contemplated that is entirely consistent not just joint ownership, because joint owners aren't bound in that way to one another at all, necessarily. Uh -huh. um, and the fact that Fairlight produced the chart, which you have seen came out a little bit later than the first round of evidence, um, was considered by the judge, and he didn't think it changed his conclusion. That's paragraph 30. He was right for at least three reasons. The first one was, um, as we noted yesterday, the charge from, uh, in favour of Citibank by Fairlight predate the purchase of the property, the painting. So there was clearly no actual intention on anybody's part, whether it's Fairlight or Citibank, that the charge would apply to the painting, because it didn't exist as property belonging to Fairlight at the time. And no one could possibly have addressed their mind to that question at all. And certainly there's no evidence that anybody had even addressed their mind to the effect of the charge <coughs> when the property was purchased. As far as I'm aware, there is absolutely zero evidence that um, it was alive as an issue at any stage, even once the property had been purchased. And, and the existence of that earlier charge that does refer to artwork generically, of course, uh, doesn't answer the question whether the charge actually applied to Fairlight's interest in the painting once it was acquired subsequently. It merely begs that very question. And we would say that if this therefore becomes a circular point, because if it was partnership property, as we say it was, um, then the charge, properly construed, would not have applied to the painting at all, absent the consent of the partnership to allow it to happen. Because no one uh, knew, apart from the partners, that it was partnership property. Citibank had no idea. So it wasn't, it wasn't stuck with the implicit authority of the partnership. Um, and there was never any authority on, on behalf of the partnership or indeed Mr. Vice or Mark Vice Limited to allow it to be charged and therefore potentially scupper the dealing, the business. So that actually, the, it's very unlikely in my submission, although it doesn't need to be decided, that the charge even bit on Fairlight's interest in the painting at all, certainly if there was a partnership. And that might be one reason why uh, your lordships and your ladyship might think um, partnership adds something. Because um, if it were other, it, it, it can't, it, it, if this is partnership property, the charge won't have bitten on it and it won't have prevented a, a dealing by the partnership to, to sell it by Sotheby's. It's just possible, I suppose, that if, if, it, was, if it was just, just purely co, co owned, that the charge might have had an effect on the ability of. Um, the sale to happen. That that might be a reason why partnership does does add something. At the end of the day, of course, all it would all it would show is that if, if um, Fairlight couldn't charge its share of the property consistently with whatever agreement was reached with Mark, there was a breach of that agreement. And certainly, no one's ever suggested that the existence of the charge encumbered the painting as it got sold on to the buyer and back again. So it doesn't really go in. But um, there's no evidence, in fact, that anyone at Fairlight or anywhere else considered whether the granting of the charge, even if it did apply to the painting, 
was consistent or otherwise with the joint business that they were engaged in to sell it for profit. So at best, it's entirely equivocal in my submission at that point. And um, uh, for my other friend, at best for me, it's one good reason why a partnership is the correct analysis, because it actually prevents the charge um, biting and, and scuppering mm -hmm. the, the objective. And the final reason, of course, why um, neither partner could, it must have been agreed that neither partner could deal with the property, was because the sale of the painting was intended to be the way by which Miss Mark Vice Limited repaid the loan uh, that Fairlight had advanced the purchase of the painting in the first place. That loan was running at 7% a year, as you know. And the evidence was that it was, I think this was accepted by Mr. Kerr, it was overwhelmingly likely that the proceeds of sale would be used by Mr. Vice to pay back the loan. He wouldn't have needed a loan, of course, if he'd had the money in the first place. So if Fairlight were free, um, absent a partnership, to obstruct the reap, to, to prevent the sale of the painting, because it could charge or dispose of its half of it, then that would scupper the entire deal as far as Mark Vice was concerned, because he, he, he would be left with a loan that it could not repay or might not be able to repay. And it would be continuing to rack up at 7%, and that cannot have been the intention of the um, There is no significant uncertainty at all, in fact, about the division of the profits. And the judge didn't fail to deal with that, contrary to my learned friend's skeleton. But this is in judgment power 28. Of course, you don't have to have a 50-50 split for a partnership. You can have any split you like, as long as it's agreed. Um, but this was a 50 50 split with a potential for a bonus if the legwork Mr. Vice did got the partnership a particularly good price, which it did. But that split, in fact, is entirely consistent with the partnership. Um, and finally, the unexecuted draft agreement that was sent unsolicited by Mr. Vice, <coughs> sorry, to Mr. Vice by Fairlight and um, Mr. Kovitz's lawyers, that's quite a less one, tab 148, but we don't need to go to it. Um, an unexecuted, unnegotiated draft of the clause saying that the agreement it, it, it is contained within does not create a partnership uh, says absolutely nothing one way or another at all. Not least in this case, because for the reasons we set out in our skeleton and Mr. Smoohar set out in his skeleton below, the agreement on any analysis in the draft form did not reflect what is now agreed to be the arrangement. It, it doesn't reflect it at all. So the fact that that contained a particular term of any description is utterly irrelevant to how uh, one might characterise it. In what particular way does it not reflect what's now agreed? Yeah, uh, yes, this was a point Mr. Smoohar was going to deal with. I, was, right. I flag it and leave it for your yes. anticipation. Yes. Um, but it, it doesn't really matter how far or otherwise it does diverge from the ultimate arrangement made, of course, um, because Mr. Vice, on behalf of MWL, didn't agree to it. And there's no evidence as to um, the fact that it was ever negotiated or discussed. And incidentally, you will have noted that that document was purporting to be between four parties, not just the two partners. It included the two principals personally. And there's no dispute that there was never a partnership including those two individuals. So what, what the criticism of the judge is that he somehow suggested I think, in, in, in my friend's skeleton that he, he, he used the draft as positive support for his conclusion, when in fact what he does clearly in paragraph 31 of the judgment is disregarded because it's not signed. That's the right approach. It's not, it's not of weight one way or another. And he was obviously right to do that. Um, we, got, we also ascertained yesterday, thanks to her ladyship, that it was sent considerably after the purchase of the property. It was only sent on the um, 8th of July, I think we worked out, on 2010, which was a, a month or two after the painting had been purchased. So it can't possibly have dictated the nature of the arrangement that was agreed back in May or June when it was purchased. And um, there, is, there was, as far as I'm aware, correct if I'm wrong, no evidence that anyone tried to make it reflect what they thought, well, 
uh, let me leave it. It was never negotiated, and, and, and no evidence as to how it came to be in the terms it did among the two sides of the culture. Finally, and I keep saying that, so I apologise, because I keep thinking this is a potentially important point. It really picks up on something my Lord Lord Justice Henderson made a moment ago. Uh, my little friend looked at the Lind Lindley and Banks extracts in the bundle um, to show that co owners are not necessarily partners, and he was right to do that. That's greed. Um, that's at tab 16 of the second authority. But what he didn't do was then take your lordships and your ladyship through the list of factors that are set out in extenso there that distinguish joint ownership and, 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 and partnership. Because in my submission, if one does that, and I, I, I do invite you just to take it out briefly, because the essential debate between us is whether this was a relationship of joint owners, but not quite a relationship of partners. And when you actually look through what are the indicia of partnership as opposed to joint ownership, it's bundle, six, uh, bundle 2, tab 16, page 91 of Lindley. Um, you'll see that actually, where there are differences, mostly they are in favour of a partnership in our case. So, point one is co-ownership, um, not necessarily resulting from an agreement, where partnership is the result of an agreement. Well, that's, that's, that's our case. It's certainly an implied agreement, uh, if not an express one. Secondly, community of profit or loss. That, that comes down in our favour too, clearly. Uh, thirdly, in relation to um, transferring of interest and so forth, it says a co-owner can, but a partner rarely will be able to. That comes down firmly on our side too. The judge held it was entitled to that they couldn't transfer it because it would have made a mockery of the business above the claim. Fourthly, a co-owner is not the agent of the other owners, where in this case it's accepted they were agents uh, for some purpose. And, of course, that is exactly what a partner is uh, in a partnership. Uh, the Liam point isn't really, isn't really relevant here because it's just simply not arisen. Um, so six is the sale of land by compulsion, so we don't need to deal with that. Although some, some reference to a, a trust of land is, is mentioned by my learned friend in Skeleton, but he didn't. And then finally, co-ownership doesn't necessarily have its purpose as the realisation of gain, which is the very essence of partnership. So actually, if you're going to contradistinguish contra um, the two concepts, ours falls quite clearly on the line not of joint ownership, uh, and aid, uh, but of partnership. In terms of the final analysis, my, my lady picked up a point yesterday whether it was said below that the sub-agency cases are still engaged even if there is a partnership. And my learned friend's case now is that even if there is a partnership, it is not determinative of the authority question because there, the sub-agency cases are still engaged because Mark Vice Limited was the agent of the partnership and therefore Sotheby's was the sub-agent of the partnership and therefore Sotheby's was not in privity with the partnership. That's all wrong for the reasons I opened on the privity point. Uh, but it's also wrong for another reason, which is potentially quite important and actually highlights the error into which he, he has fallen. If there was a partnership the premise of this point, then any partner clearly had the authority to bind the partnership. And that means bind the partnership to the consignment agreement with Sotheby's, not just transfer of title by the partnership to the ultimate buyer. So whenever you've got a part partnership, the partner has to act through some representative in signing a contract, or almost always. And the case that appears to be run against me is that because this partnership appointed MWL one of the partners, to represent it in the signing of the contract with Sotheby. MWL was acting as an agent of the partnership rather than binding the partnership directly to Sotheby's. 
But that cannot be right. It cannot be, cannot be right that that converts Sotheby's into a subagency. And it's the fallacy, really, at the heart of my learned friend's case on subagency. And it's the same if you have posit a, con a corporate entity as the party in question. And in fact, it's the exact case here, isn't it? Um, in fact, because Mark Vice Limited signed the sale contract, contract A, through the agency of Mr. Vice Person. Imagine that the, the, Mark Vice Limited was the only owner of the property. On my learned friend's analysis, the fact that Mark Vice Limited delegates authority to enter the contract A, the Mark <coughs> Vice brackets director or agent or representative makes Mr. Vice the agent in the relationship as the sub-agent. And, and clearly, that, is, that, that, that would be ridiculous. And then really, that is all, all I want to say about the partnership. Because I mean, your simple point is that MWL is a partner in its own right. And therefore, when it acts, it's acting quite a partner, mm. not as where it were yes. itself an agent of yeah. the partner. I mean, it is, but only as a, <laughs> in its Yes, and it's a slightly elusive distinction, but what I wanted to try to make, my final point, was that it applies as much to the present factual scenario, even if you discount partnership, because the, you cannot say that Mr. Vice was the agent and Sotheby's was the sub-agent at all. The truth is that the principals in these relationships have to act through a representative, mm. and um, you don't treat them as agent and, and, and principal treat them as the principle. Yeah. That is therefore a partnership that I want to say on that. Um, turning then to GAV, you only get to the GAV point if our respondent's notice point is wrong. Uh, and so that's my primary position, that it's, it's, it is actually literally irrelevant. Um, there are two aspects on the GAV point to my learned friend's appeal. The first is a question of construction, and therefore, I suppose, an alleged error of law on the part of the judge. The second is the judge's application of the clause of the facts. And um, we'll, we'll, we can, well, my learned friend really didn't go into that very much because it's dealt with quite extensively in the skeleton, and I probably won't need to either, unless uh, you ask me. But on the question of construction, the legal question, Fairlight's appeal actually, when you look at the documents, is quite narrow. It says that the judge was wrong because the GAV clause required a headcount of the following to determine a majority view, and that is the construction argument. So if you uh, are against Mr. Collins on the headcount, his legal challenge to the construction the judge approved, uh, applied is, is really all, all, all over. That's great. If you look at in terms of the grounds of appeal, that's 3.1 and 3.2 of Bundle C, tap on page 18 and 9. Um, I'll deal with that in a moment in more detail, but on the question of application for facts, you'll have seen those in grounds 3.3 to 3.8, which really take a, discrete, a series of discrete evidential points as they apply to individual experts or non-experts and um, argues that the judge should or shouldn't have taken into account when you actually put up the headcount. Uh, but we don't get to that, really, if the judge was wrong, we will correct on the headcount, which he obviously was. Um, on the construction, the easy way through the construction argument, in my submission, is simply to look at the clause itself, which um, you'll recall is only in contract B, um, and note that the clause specifically does uh, distinguish, on one hand, the existence of generally accepted views, and on the other hand, a divergence of views. And one thing you can therefore safely conclude on construction is that if there is a divergence of views, there isn't a generally accepted set of views. And really, that's the end of it, because it's, it can scarcely not be accepted that there was a divergence of views, because one of the three leading scholars uh, had a view that diverged from at least one of the other three leading scholars. And there was a debate about whether the other leading scholar had even expressed any view at all. So, in a sense, um, that's, the, that's all one really needs to do to dispose of the, of the construction argument. 
Um, not least because whatever gloss Mr. Collins put on it, I don't mean that unfairly, I, I just can't remember exactly how he put the divergence of views point. We do know that there's a clear pleaded case, which I'll just show you from Fairlight at bundle C tab 16, please. Bundle C, core bundles, tab 16, page 241. Uh, and it's paragraph 48C of the re, re amendment of Benson County in Fairlight, where they plead in terms that there was a divergence of views. Again, please. Two four one. Forty eight C. So there is no scope to argue whether there was a divergence of views. The only scope, my learned friend, is to argue that you can have both a divergence of views and somehow generally accepted views as to the attribution of a painting. <coughs> and if he is wrong about that, then that is the end of the I, in my submission, is obviously one the Because you say that the, um, the contract clause, which refers to generally accepted views and divergence within the same sentence, mm -hmm. is, is a strong indicator that those are two sides of the same point. Exactly. Yes. yes. And they obviously are as a matter of linguistic analysis. Well, they might or might not. I mean, one, one could argue it doesn't matter. Yes. In, in, in this situation, I mean, all, clearly, clearly generally accepted and divergent had different functions in the sense that um, it didn't apply if there was an indication of divergence in the description of the yes. property. Yes. So although although they come at it maybe at a different angle um, uh, yes, different function, right. they are clearly being in the same sentence. Yes. It meant to be antonyms, as it were, or opposite descriptions. Yes, but they can't be exhaustive, no, otherwise not in those circumstances you're sort of reliable. Quite. It may have been what they rather like, but I think it would be a bit extreme. Uh, uh, they could be, yes, that's right. I mean, well, they could be exhaustive in this sense that, as my Lord, uh, Lord Dr. Peter Jackson said, mm. it's the description as divergent that matters, not, not the divergence as such. So it's possible that... It's what is it? So you have to look at the little description at the top, and yeah. if, if, only if that indicates a divergence of views is that second bloom engaged. Okay, exactly, even though there might be a divergence. Well, there may be a divergence of views. But your Lordship's right, as you said yesterday, there is a middle ground, which is yeah. very much our case, and very much... Yeah, that's the middle ground. So you, you generally accepted yes. views must allow of one, one divergence. But, but uh, well, not, we say, a divergence of the relevant views of scholars and experts. You, if you, you might get someone who's a bit harebrained coming out saying this is, I don't think this is a house. And you say, well, that doesn't count for the purposes of what a view of a scholar and expert is, either by virtue of the nature of the view, the person giving it, the form in which it was given, whether it was had, you know, all the reasons why these views have different kinds of weight. Anyway, but, you, also, you, say, you say you have the middle ground, which is? The middle ground is that in cases like this where the painting is new to the market, new to the world, uh, it will in, inevitably be the case until it's been the subject of study by scholars and experts that no generally accepted view will have emerged. So this goes beyond the wording and say, well, is there a divergence or is there a generally accepted view? The third one is, in our, in our primary case, is the church held. Um, and there's no real engagement with this argument, by the way, on the part of their life. I don't, I don't, they say the headcount works. They don't actually explain why, why the views have to be considered in the judge's terms, or in our terms, why they have to be the result of a proper scholarly and expert process. But they obviously do have to be. We say that what happens, as you can appreciate in the, in the art world, are, are that a new painting comes to the market. A, a painting like this, monogrammed work by a, a master, uh, will have created, as I think you said yesterday, quite a, quite a surprise and a shock because um, the fact it's monogram, it's an autographed work by all accounts, does look very startling. What then happens in the art world is, is obvious. There are um, views expressed by those who are in a position to express these views. And um, we say what generally accepted means is that those views coalesce through a, uh, an iterative, discursive, 
dialectical process where experts and scholars look at each other's opinions and views and a generally accepted view emerges. Now, of course, that is um, it's the, basically the product of a consensus based on informed well, but Mr. Mr. Collins points to the fact that it's views, not views. Yes, just that, that they generally accepted views. Well, uh, your ladyship supplied the answer. That's my submission yesterday. The, the point is that the clause talks about generally accepted views because of, it applies to a description of a painting that can include all sorts of different aspects. When you actually consider the facts of this case, we're concerned about attribution. Was it a house? Was it not? That is a binary question. You either have a view that it is, or you have a view that it isn't, or you have no view one way or another, so it's not clear. But it may not be binary in the very common case where the painter has a studio, large degrees of studio participation. I mean, what? Whether it's often just a question of opinion, really, whether you call that an autograph or not. Or yes, but what I, what I mean, you're not quite right, and that people will disagree because some parts of the piece might have been painted by the studio, others might be yes. part to be painted by but the frequently the happens. So, yeah. But the point is there's a definite binary of when, a, when an, exp an opinion is expressed that it's an autograph work, it either is or it isn't. It's your view that it is, or your view that it isn't, or your view that it's the studio or, or a mixture. <coughs> the point here is that the singular and plural is a perfectly acceptable way of describing the single issue that was before the judge in this case. It was a single view, and it, uh, or at least it was a, the views of a single issue, namely attribution. So when you, whether, when you say, um, does the description accord with generally accepted views? That was obviously apt to apply to attribution, dating, uh, you know, whether it was an early work or a late work. And there were going to be dif differently expressed views from all sorts of experts and scholars on those various issues. And what you have on attribution is a collection of individual views. So whether, when you ask, were there generally accepted views of scholars and experts, that this was a, an autograph work by Simon Cowan. <coughs> it is essentially the same as asking whether a consensus had coalesced. Mm. A, a generally accepted view on that particular question. And, and, and certainly, my, my friend made no attempt, and really, there isn't any, any way to make that point matter. In a, in a sense, it doesn't go anywhere. For linguistic point that the judge on one occasion refers to views but then on another occasion paraphrases as a view that it's an authentic for himself. It doesn't go anywhere because on any analysis the judge knew what he was asking and he was asking whether the considered views of the experts he was told were experts which is largely agreed amounted to a generally accepted view or views that this was a friend's house. It's simply a, a dead end point, really. But of course, it's a. Um, it, it's one my learned friend sees it. Well, the singular plural thing. Um, clearly, um, views of all the, all the many contributors will be a plural yes, exactly. um, thing. But actually, what the clause is looking for is something singular, uh, which is a general acceptance of the view. You're quite right. And you, I think uh, your Lordship asked who, who's doing the accepting here. And my learned friend supplied the answer we would agree with, which is obviously it's the other, the experts and scholars amongst themselves are agreeing yeah. with the views yeah. expressed by the experts. And if you want to look at similarly, so that there, there is a that there, there is a general acceptance. There may be people who are not on that road, um, as it were. If there's a divergence, yeah. that is a singular fact, but it just is a description, a single description yeah. of the fact that there is a divergence. Yeah. Uh, that, that's right. Mm. Sorry. For that. I see that that, that, that the time. Um, Would that be a good moment? A perfectly good moment. And you'll appreciate I'm going quite quickly through. I don't anticipate we to spend too much more time on Gav. There's then only the other subsequent owner point for me to deal with. So I anticipate finishing quite soon after lunch. Well, thank you very much. Well, that should leave plenty of time, I hope, for Mr. Silhan to reply. Good. Well, we'll continue at 4 o'clock. Thank you all very much. Bye.